All right, it's 7.30 on uh, Tuesday, January 4th. Uh, we'll start tonight's uh, study session of our Banner School District 116. Uh, roll call, please. Member Hasanacha. Here. Member Orr. Here. Member Hall. Here. Member Agalski. Here. Member Carter is here. Vice President Exum. Here. And President Pulaski. Here. Are there any additions, corrections, or modifications to tonight's agenda? Uh, hearing uh, none, we'll move into citizen statements. We've had four emailed to the district. Uh, the first is from Yuli Brishnikov. Uh, dear members of the board, dear Dr. Ivory Tatum, and dear student ambassadors, we would like to provide some context for the item seven on the agenda, dealing with the approval of the waiver to the section 17-1.5 of the school code aiming to increase the district's administrative costs above what the code allows. According to the latest stats, USD 116 had the administrator to student ratio of one to 133 higher than in Champaign District 4, one to 141, and much higher than Bloomington Normals Unit 5, one to 211. Meanwhile, the average administrative salary in Urbana School District is 120,411 per annum, above the state average, easily beating Champaign's 99-104 or Bloomington Normals 88-036. The ratios of average salaries of administrators of teachers is 2.22 in Urbana, 1.72 in Champaign, and 1.42 in Bloomington Normals. We will present a detailed comparative analysis elsewhere, but it should be clear that our district is already suffering from significant bureaucratic bloat which spends on administration per student way more than the nearby metro area districts. To address the all too important challenge of overcoming educational disparities by expanding the administrative apparatus is, in our view, by far not the best way to proceed. If the board believes the new director position is the key to closing gaps in educational outcomes, we should outline what specific actions this hire would enable and what outcomes it would affect. We urge the board to give the matter careful examination it deserves. Respectfully, Yuli Barishnikov. <coughs> the second is from Ruth Kantorovich. <coughs> Dear members of the board, as part of your study of the school improvement goals, <coughs> item 9.2 on the agenda, I urge you to take a closer look at the teaching method that is used at our elementary schools during the literacy block. Sorry. Uh, the teaching method is based on the station rotation model. This blended learning model is highly popular as it is supposed to provide a more personalized learning experience, engage students in collaborative projects, and challenge them with online interactive material. The idea is to divide the class into three to four small groups according to the student's academic level. The class time is partitioned into 20-minute intervals using a timer where the groups rotate between stations with different tasks. In the standard model, a 90-minute literary block, literacy block may be divided into four stations with 10 minutes budgeted for transition or flex time. One station is for a teacher-led discussion, second station for collaborative work, third station for online tasks, and a fourth station for individual work such as writing. However, the implementation of the rotation model in our elementary schools and specifically at Yankee Ridge is far from this ideal picture. At Yankee Ridge, the average student spends about 90% of the ELA time without any interactions following the zero talking rule. They pass time between stations with unengaging busy work tasks below grade level. To clarify, here is what a typical 90 minutes ELA block looks like at Yankee Ridge. <coughs> the class is divided into four groups by reading level. Usually group one is below grade level, groups two and three are at grade level, and group four is above grade level. There are five stations, yes, you read five correctly. Stations one through four are reading, listening to audiobooks, even in fourth grade. Word work and writing. The tasks do not involve practicing any newly learned material. In word work, the students write sight words, forwards and backwards, while the writing in the student's journal is not shared or corrected by a teacher. Station five, is at the teacher's desk, the groups rotate the first four stations quietly, no talking allowed, 
If the students talk to each other, they may lose recess time. They are not allowed to talk to the teacher either because the teacher is busy at station five. There, the teacher leads an, the reading groups in 20-minute sessions, meeting once a week with the advanced group, twice a week with the middle group, and three times a week with the group that is far below grade level. Now, if you have mastered addition and telling time, which according to the Common Core should happen around third grade, but if you are a typical Yankee Ridge student, it is more likely to happen after sixth grade, estimating from the Illinois state data. You would know that the reading groups only account for two hours out of over seven hours of ELR time per week. What happens at the teacher station during the five hours left over ELA time every week? You may think that the teacher may be visiting other stations, checking on students' work, and giving feedback. Unfortunately not. The teacher is busy at her desk doing one-to-one -one assessments endlessly. If you were to visit the classroom and watch an individual student during an ELA block instead of watching the action at the teacher's desk, you'll see him spending between 60 and 90 minutes every day on his own, rotating between stations, doing mindless tasks, and learning nothing new. In fourth grade, he writes in his journal, at the same level as he did in sixth grade, no one notices. When the timer goes off, he moves on to a reading comic book on Epic. 20 minutes later, he is still on Epic, and no one notices what he reads. During the final 20 minutes, he finishes the required one worksheet on the weak sight words, scrambling and unscrambling words such as every, when, because, and stop. No one checks his work. He finishes early so he can go back to reading Captain Underpants for another 10 minutes. On Fridays, he has a reading group instead of the audiobook station. He gets to go to station five for 20 minutes. There, the students take turns reading aloud from the book. The teacher asks a couple of questions about the characters and predictions. Then they need to write something down, but the timer goes off and they won't get back this until the next time his group meets. There is no homework. He'll probably forget what he read by then and will have to reread during his group time. Meanwhile, he is back to the silent ELA station routine. It is no wonder that in 2019, pre-pandemic, only 24% of Yankee Ridge students were proficient in ELA between 2015 and 2019 we fell more than 15 percentage points. We used to be above the state average, now we are 15 percentage points below the state average. Perhaps our school improvement goals should focus more on instruction methods, and clearly we have some doorway. The next is from Mike Madigan. Uh, dear members of the school board, first, we first thank you for your service, especially in these trying times. We truly appreciate it. We write to urge you to keep our children in school. Yes, this pandemic is surging again, but it is mostly a variant that is mild in effect and will ultimately keep, will ultimately help build immunity. Our child and many others are vaccinated. We assume most teachers and administrators are as well. The CDC has reduced quarantining for those who are symptomatic, indicating that this is a variant of mild effect that will run its course. Our child suffered mental and emotional illness throughout the remote learning of last year. She learned a fraction of what she would have in person. This will only worsen if you send her home again. We urge you to make accommodations for those who have underlying conditions to be able to learn remotely. But the total health of our child and her peers needs to be paramount in your decision making. And the only decision that makes total health and well-being into account is to remain in person for learning. Sincerely, Michael and Sinead Manigan. And the last is from Cord Schroeder. Dear school board and administration, first, thank you, for, thank you all for your time and efforts. I appreciate the hard work you all do to help our community. Second, please continue to keep our children attending school. The difference between last year and this year is unbelievable. The students are learning more in the classrooms and in the social atmosphere. This year is representative of what we hoped we would have when we chose Urbana High School. I was incredibly disappointed last year when numerous classes did not teach the entire syllabus. This was directly blamed on remote learning by several teachers. Please do not place our students or teachers in this position again. Keep school in school so our community can continue to work towards a brighter tomorrow. Thank you. Cord Schroeder. And that's it for citizen statements that were sent in. Does anybody else wish to address the board tonight? Seeing no one, uh, 
There is no call tonight for an executive session after tonight's meeting. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. Uh, roll call, please. Member Hall? Yes. Member Agalski? Yes. Member Hasanaka? Yes. Member Orr? Yes. Member Carter votes yes. Vice President Axon? Yes. And President Pulaski? Yes. We have an agenda. We do have a public hearing tonight. Uh, 7.1 is a public hearing on the proposed application for waiver section 17-1.15. So Carol's joining us via Zoom. I think she was going to share a little bit of background prior to that. Can you hear us, Carol? Sure. Okay. Yes, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, just wanted to uh, share that this uh, waiver basically is the first time we've ever had to do one of these um, in my 29 years here. So this isn't something that happens often. Um, but it, with the combination of COVID and uh, this new administration administrative position, it's requiring us to ask for this waiver. Uh, when you approved the audit back in October, there was a page of the AF annual financial report that showed um, administrative cost cap worksheet. It's a where we go through this computation where it looks at last year's um, audited figures of administrative costs compared to what we budgeted for FY22. So when the audit was completed and we realized that was going to be over, we realized we were going to have to go through this process. Um, the other process that you could go through is amending the budget, but the budget's correct. It's because of the addition of the Director of Equity and Inclusion uh, for this year that is why we went over. Uh, the law allows you to be um, at 105%. We were at 106%, so we were only over 1%. But unfortunately, because of that 1%, we have to go through this process. Um, so what we have to do is we had to file um, a notice in the paper that we were having the public hearing. So if anybody wanted to come and speak to it, they could. Um, then we uh, put it, we had to send letters out to all of our legislators and our teachers union, letting them know we were having the public hearing this evening. Um, like I said, we had it in the newspaper as well. So uh, we have to file all of this information to the legislature to let them know that we've followed all the things we need to follow and ask for the waiver. And then well, that will get approved um, this spring. So um, that's the process. And tonight is just a piece of that process to be able to apply for this waiver. So are there any questions? Okay, thank you, Carol. And with that, I'd like to open tonight's public hearing with regards to the application for the waiver. Does anyone wish to address the board about the application process for uh, waiver section 17-1.5? Is anyone, we'll wait about 20 seconds here. Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. All right. Um, okay. Before we, we progress any further, um, I'd like to take a moment of silence tonight to remember the life of uh, Jordan Atbar Lewis, one of our kids who was lost far, far too soon. Next up, I'd like our student ambassador report. Uh, Paul, Parker Michaels, is there something you'd like to present tonight? Okay. Um, I do have a concern about the way lunch has been um, handled recently. Last semester, students, we as students, we were informed that if we had great grades, we would not have to attend studio time anymore. This has ultimately resulted in an increase of students that are eating lunch in the commons room, meaning that there's not any space, meaning that's a problem for COVID related reasons. Um, although there is a staff member there that is constantly saying only four students should be at a table there are no students that are following these rules and it's just being broken pro um, 
constantly. So I think it's a problem because there's not enough space. Um, and we're not, we're not, it's not, when it's not following the protocols for battling COVID the correct way. So that's just one of my concerns for the upcoming semester. That's all I got. Um, I agree with Michael. I think it's hard to feel safe in the commons at lunchtime when there's so many kids in there, all with their masks off eating. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, our first administrative report tonight is the door detection system demo and discussion. Okay, so um, John and I are going to tag team this and we have our uh, guest from Open Gate um, Lori, can you, okay, perfect. So Laura and Ravi, um, we have been making adjustments to this PowerPoint up until the last minute. The other board members have a copy of their sheet. So uh, Lori is sending you a PDF copy now. I think she has everyone, does everyone have a copy of their sheet? Okay, I will share it with everybody. Okay, I'll just share it with everybody. All right, John. Yeah, and we are also uh, joined tonight uh, by Tom McDermott. Uh, so a couple weeks ago, we had discussed the uh, Evolve system. Uh, I think at the time you guys had asked us to make sure that we were thorough and uh, looked into make sure that that was the best system. Uh, since then, uh, we've also been looking into the open gate system uh, and we've presented this, it's a, a different kind of system. It's a little bit more streamlined. It's a lot easier to operate with less staff. Uh, the uh, total cost of the system implementing is about uh, a little less than a third as much as the ori original system that we were looking at. Uh, and it has a lot of other benefits. So uh, in just to be equitable, we wanted to make sure that we uh, had Tom here tonight uh, to talk a little bit about the open gate system and what o it offers. Uh, this is again, uh, much like the other one we talked about, it is not a metal detector where you're walking through a gate ring and you have people kind of scrutinizing you. This is an open flow system where the uh, biggest takeaway is it's not really impeding students as they're coming into the building. They just kind of walk through as they normally would. Uh, it's an open post uh, and we'll probably see some pictures here in just a minute, uh, similar to uh, the other one that we looked at. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tom uh, and he can talk in a little bit about it. We did test this out with the uh, crisis committee and had one of these on site where we were able to kind of walk through and see how it would work with Chromebooks and different devices that students had. And uh, the cri crisis committee was also very appreciative of being able to see the system and how quickly and easily it's set up. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Tom, and you can go ahead. Great, thanks, John. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, so just real quick, Tom McDermott um, from CHEA. I'm the uh, National School Safety and Security Sales Manager for CHEA. I've uh, been in the security industry for more than 20 years. Um, so just some real quick background on CHEA before we get into the open gate, was, which is a very specific detector of ours. We've been at this uh, for more than 50 years. Originally, you know, our headquarters is in Italy. Uh, we're an R&D company, been around since 68. You know, global company. This is not a, a small company. Um, again, since 62, started textiles, started R&D on the walkthrough detectors in 75. Uh, patented the first one um, in 82. Um, and, you know, from there, we just more and more uh, patents and we've got the UN using us, um, all kinds of people around the world using our different technologies. Um, I'm going to jump through quite a bit. We've got three major, four major divisions, and I'm just going to focus on the security division, but we do industrial food and pharmaceutical. They've got to look for metal and foods as well and other things. Our ground search program is what we do with the military, looking for IEDs and then war-torn countries. Uh, we've really taught the UN how to do this in, in lots of countries around the world. So this isn't uh, just a walk through metal detector company. 
Um, most people know us through airport security. Uh, TSA has been using us since just after 9-11, uh, but airports around the world have been using us, um, both our walkthroughs, uh, well, not just the walkthroughs, our shoe detectors, explosives around the world, just not in the U.S. yet. Uh, we get liquid bomb detection as well, letter bomb detection as well. These are just some of the airports around the world, so not just U.S. that use our technology. Um, building security around the world from the parliament, from the Vatican, um, you name it, they're using our technology, uh, House of Commons, and uh, gotta move this here, Secret Service uh, decided to use us since in 88. So the White House uses us and lots of other uh, institutions, uh, um, event security, of course, you know, places like Disney and things like that around the world have been using us. Uh, Major League Baseball, um, you name it, they use us. Federal Bureau of Prisons uses us. They've got to find the smallest item, uh, half a razor blade uh, for inmates. Um, people use us for loss prevention. Apple uses us. They want to find a single earbud, somebody walking out of a warehouse. Um, we do radiation detection as well. So lots of different detection capabilities. So this isn't just a walkthrough. You know, this isn't a fly-by-night company. We've been around a, a long, long time. Um, I'm not going to get into too much there. I just want to give you a little background. <clears throat> um, I'll jump into a few things here. Some of our <laughs> successes. This is recent, by the way. This is a New York Post uh, cover um, from back at December 3rd. Um, an article. <laughs> um, NYPD, the police department, has been using our detectors for many, many years, including you know New Year's Eve celebrations and things like that. Um, and New York City schools have been using us for years, but they don't have them installed at every inner city school. And what happened is a school in Brooklyn, and I can send you the article, the school in Brooklyn that, uh, that they found a gun on an individual and they decided the next day they better scan the whole school. So the NYPD brought you know, the team over um, to check out the school. And that's when they found more than 21 weapons in a single day, in a single day. Um, now that's New York City versus Urbana, but our detectors work. Um, you use them, it'll find the weapon. Yeah, and um, Tom, I just wanted to highlight uh, at some point as we're starting to go through the survey uh, data, one of the questions that was asked of both school and staff is do they feel that there's uh, items in the school, and we'll be able to look at that later, but especially on the staff survey, there's kind of an overwhelming feeling that, yes, there's something in the schools that we're missing. Yeah, and that's something every school has to decide, Every not just every school, every organization. Uh, just like I mentioned, Apple's trying to make sure you know, people aren't stealing earbuds because they're pretty expensive. So really, it's, it, it, it's up to you to tell us what do you need to be able to detect? I just jumped through a number of our different detectors just to give you some examples. We have lots of different walkthrough detectors depending on what you need to be able to find. Um, again, you know, we can find half a cutter blade, which is what was used uh, during 9-11 to, to you know, slash people and, and, and pilots and things like that. So half an exacto is really what that is. So Federal Bureau of Prisons, lots of people have it set that low. As a matter of fact, NYPD, they use that as well in the New York City schools because kids are slicing each other with razor blades, uh, getting in fights with screwdrivers and things like that. Honestly, they're, you know, although they found 21 weapons at this school, it wasn't 21 guns, by the way. Uh, it was a mix of, of knives and guns. But they find um, screwdrivers and razor blades on kids every day because one, some are fighting in the aggressor and some are just defending themselves. So they, they're looking for the smaller items. Um, you have to tell us, you know, what you want to detect. The open gate is our latest detector uh, that came about from uh, working with the NFL that wanted to move people a lot faster. Um, and that's really what this is about. I'll just do a quick video here. It's probably the best way to show it um, is just one example. Can you guys see that? So this is people just, you can see walking through, carrying all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's just two poles there. Um, just, you know, pretty quickly walking through. It's very, very simple with portable units, wireless. 
weigh less than 25 pounds. You can pick it up and, and move it. Very, very simple. <clears throat> but this came after 50 years of, of research and development, working with clients like the NFL and said, what do you need? Matter of fact, that gentleman right there, Aaron was head of security for Disney for 10 plus years and used our technology. Now he works for us. So a lot of our technologies come for working with partners like Disney uh, and the NFL and, and what's next. But you saw how quickly he set that up. Um, I'll show you another video here. Um, yeah. Give you an idea how quickly compared to the evolved system you looked at. Um, now you guys didn't have that come in but this is how even this is a former Secret Service agent, by the way, for 30 years and worked in the White House and, and uh, worked for President Bush and actually on 9-11. Um, but this is how easy it is to set up uh, as opposed to the Evolve, which literally takes hours to set up and you can't move it. But if you need to move it from inside to a dance, to a football game, to a school board meeting, it's literally as simple as this. He's just cheating and measuring it getting it to about 36 inches and that's really it i mean that's how quickly it, it you know you can set it up um let me show you um <clears throat> what we're able to do though so this is one of our techs um that is going to show you that he's going to walk through and he just alarmed i'm going to show you what he's carrying Got a handgun. That's what alarmed on. And you can walk through either way, by the way. He's just kind of showing you it stays green. So no alarm on that. I'll show you what he's carrying just as an example. Personal items now. That's a vape pen. I purposely showed you this because for some schools, of course, that's a prohibited item. But for us, it's not a it's not a what we call a mass casualty threat. Yeah, obviously, um, and neither would we consider a Swiss Army knife a mass casualty, but we, we call this a weapons detector because it's not a metal detector because there's all kinds of metal there. He just walked through and it did not alarm on, but alarmed on the gun. So he's going to put that back and uh, it, it alarmed on the gun. I'll show you another example of that where, the back, where he's got a backpack full of stuff. Oops. Still running. Yeah, so he was carrying the gun back through on that one. This has got a backpack full of stuff. Again, it's taking the gun out, which it alarmed on. And walking through, no alarm. Let's see what he's carrying now. Phone, keys with a fob, two fobs on it, actually, which often set it off. Vape pen again, and these discussions we'll have in a second about vape pen, tobacco tin. So he's got he's got an umbrella in there. He's got sunscreen, metal bottle, of course, tablet, tin, <laughs> tin, and another phone. It's a backup battery. So he was able to walk through with everything, um, but alarmed on the gun when he walked through. Another tablet, by the way. And another water bottle. So he was able to carry all that through, but it only alarmed when he had the gun. Now, Tom, I will jump in. Yeah. Uh, we did yeah, test please. this with uh, all of the Chromebooks, kind of all of the various model of Chromebooks, and the same as the other system we were looking at, the hinge of the Chromebook is basically looks like the barrel of the gun. Uh, we were, since yeah. we had one of these on site, uh, we were able to kind of do a few different things to see how we could mitigate those false uh, nuisance alarms on Chromebooks. Uh, one thing that we did, I think it was in crisis committee that we were pretty successful with, if you just hold the Chromebook over your head, uh, then yeah. it does not alarm. As long as that's the only thing in your hand, which it's pretty easy to see at that point, uh, that's one way. Uh, the other thing that I think some other school districts around the country have been doing 
there's a pass around where there's a table kind of to the side Correct. and they pass it around that. Uh, Correct. This one did do a lot better with the kind of, uh, what do you call them? The thicker Nalgene bottles, uh, the, yeah. the hydro flasks, the thick metal yeah. water bottles, where when we were testing before, it was keying a lot of uh, nuisance alarms on the hydro flask type, uh, kind of thick insulated water bottles. Yeah, which ours go through. I mean, I carry a hydro flask with me, and that's what I test with all the time, and no problem. Now, again, it depends what you're set for. So as a matter of fact, we can um, clear and you know, discriminate against Chromebooks, but not if you're looking for a smaller handgun. So it's like everything is a trade-off. So if it's a larger gun, well, then you can get the Chromebook through. But, uh, you know, like most schools, you want to find that smaller handgun uh, versus like a Tech 9, something small, you know, larger that's truly mass casualty with larger clips and things like that. So if it was set for that, your Chromebooks would get through all day long. Um, so we do have, so we have tested about 100 different Chromebooks, but um, not able to discriminate the Chromebook when you're really looking for a small handgun. Not yet, anyway. Uh, but again, this is something, you know, years ago it was, you know, our customers asked us, hey, can you can you discriminate the cell phone so they don't have to take it out of your pocket and keys and coins? And so we've been doing that for a while. We just, you know, the technology advances just like everything else. And the best way to think about it is almost like your, your TVs, you know, back to when most of us were kids, the pixel quality was pretty poor or just like digital cameras. But now with a TV, it's 8K. It's very similar with, with our technology. It's a number of signals. And our older uh, walkthrough detectors had about 60 signals looking for a threat item. This detector has more than 300. So in effect, we're painting a better picture. And we, can, we know the difference between the metal in a water bottle and the metal in a gun. Um, it's a hardened steel. Uh, barrel um, because it heats up over you know usage, um, so it's a very different metal content, and we're able to tell the difference. Um, the issue again, like John said, with the Chromebook is because of the spine on it that looks really like a knife. So um, and because that is a hardened steel, to, so that the, the the Chromebook and notebooks hold up, um, that it's really j just as if that's a knife going through. Um, so we will find knives, although that's not really what the open gate was uh, designed for, uh, was knives. We're looking for mass casualty, but it will find knives that are designed for killing, for sure. So we're not purposely not looking for the Swiss Army knife, just like we're not looking for the vape pen with the open gate. Now, again, we've got lots of different detectors, um, you know, lots of different ones. The airport, for example, they're looking for everything. Um, so they're looking for the small knife. So with lots of different detectors, the open gate was really designed for more throughput, let people walk through with their purses and backpacks and all kinds of things, but find the mass casualty weapon. That makes sense? Any questions on that? Board members, ambassadors, <clears throat> any questions? Can I ask one? Um, Brian. What is the what is the signal itself? If you're able to tell us, is it similar to the evolved system that we were talking about before? Or is it different altogether? No, it's different. Great question. Um, so it's electromagnetics, but there's two kinds. There's passive and active. A passive detector, which evolve is, which is really what you call magnetometer. Those are are only looking for um, type of metals that can be magnetized. So you're very limited in how it goes about as, as well. Um, the technology is different. It's electromagnetics, but it's different. Ours is active. So we will find both uh, ferrous and non-ferrous metals uh, is one of the big things um, that's different in our technology. Um, yep. Um, one of the other, there's lots of differences between us and the Evolve. You know, the Evolve won't find a, a gun at the ankle level. Um, there's lots of issues with the Evolve. Again, we've been at this for over 50 years. They're relatively new to the market. Um, although I think one day they, they might have some good technology. It, it, it's got some, it, they've got a ways to go um, in how they do screening um, because you're watching a monitor versus you're watching people going through. Um, there's different issues with the actual tech itself. Board members. 
Ambassadors, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I was just kind of curious when you're talking about mass casualty weapons, is that based yeah. on um, like content of the weapon, shape of the weapon? How are, how are organizations able to define that? Great question. So in a, it's a gun, so it's more than a single shot. Okay, so it's got to be more than a single shot. So standard handgun. Now there are Department of Justice standards, by the way, for this, um, and and I can send you information on it. And there, there's another example of how we're different from Evolve. We adhere to uh, both all Department of Justice standards and international standards, which means when you say it will uh, detect a standard handgun that's a certain setting, uh, Nilesh U two B. It has to test it throughout the walkthrough of the tech, all up and down, turn it sideways, all kinds of things. But we're looking for you know, more than a single shot in the open gate. Again, different detectors will do different things. We'll find, let's see, we'll find actually in that detector you see on the screen there, we can find what we call a disassembled gun. So even a Derringer that's disassembled, which is really close to what the TSA does, they're looking for disassembled guns. So we're looking for the open gate mass casualty is like a six shooter or higher up, okay? There's a mass casualty. And as far as a knife goes with a mass casualty, consider it a hunting knife, a K bar, which the military uses. Something is designed for killing versus just, you know, you know, buck knife that kids use for, for hunting or, you know, a Swiss army knife. It's some, and the difference there is the metal content. Again, it's hardened steel. So it holds up. Most blades that kids carry, if you honestly try and stab someone, chances are it's going to break on a bone. Most of those knives won't, will not hold up, and that's why they're not considered mass casualty. Um, knives that are designed for killing, truly weapons, will hold up, and you can definitely slash a number of people. So there's no uh, legal definition for that on a knife other than... Um, uh, you know, a, uh, a knife that's truly a weapon. And there is classification for that, but not a mass casualty weapon as far as edge weapons go. And as we we're doing testing with both systems, uh, as far as what it hit on knife-wise, it was very similar. So uh, we tried it with a few different uh, sizes and types of knives uh, for both of them. And again, uh, to reiterate what Tom said, kind of the center like paring knife or little less than three inch pocket knife. Uh, neither one of those really hit on that. But again, I, and it sounds like the open gate is really ideal for you. Like it is for most schools, but, but not again, NYPD doesn't work for, so it's not for every school. So if you, you know, and we have some schools that nope, got to find the vape pen. Okay. Well, it's metal. We can find it. Sure. It's just, it's just a different detector. Um, so the detector, it'll find all kinds of things. Um, and it's really just based on the setting, but the open gate um, has a very specific design. And it's really just looking for that mass casualty. And that was something that honestly we debated with the NFL because they had those questions as well. Because honestly, some of the security staff at certain teams were like, no, we want to find you know, any knife. And you know, when it comes down to it, <laughs> the argument we had is, wait a minute, at these stadiums, you have you know, restaurants in there. You have high-end restaurants and steak restaurants. You can go grab a steak knife. So what are we talking about here? So that's also true that you guys, you know, you've got a cafeteria with knives, right? Um, unless you're using plastic these days. Um, but your know, kids can find other weapons to use. So, um, you know, you really have to have that conversation. But the open gate is about really that mass cap. So it's, look, you know, ideally looking for a gun or a larger knife. Uh, one question I have is uh, how many uh, like school installations do you have here in, in the United States and is there any uh, installation uh, close to us in Urbana? Um, there, boy, I don't know. I mean, I as far as the open gate or any detector installation? Uh, specifically the open gate, but uh, any would be, would be okay. Um, the only school in your area would be University of Illinois and Urbana is using some of ours. I forget where they're using them. They're not using them at their stadium yet. Uh, they're using them for some of their other facilities. Uh, but yeah, Urbana University of Illinois is using them. Um, no other 
uh, Springfield is uh, looking, you know, they're not around the corner, um, but they're looking at purchasing a bunch uh, for the Springfield district. Um, but not, not, not in Urbana right now. Um, but across the country, again, you know, people, you know, larger school districts, Houston, Tampa, Miami, Dallas, you know, NYPD, Chicago, you know, have all been using our detectors for years. Um, but going to the open gate again, you know, schools like NYPD or um, districts like NYPD just said it's, it's just not going to work for us because uh, we need to be able to find those smaller items. Um, but uh, and, and the open gate, by the way, just came out this year. So we're really just rolling it out. Um, just came out in April. And really, I just started hitting the road. So again, I'm uh, before this year, Che and never had anyone focused on schools. Uh, we all, but we sold the schools when they called us. We never had anyone focused on. Honestly, we were focused more on the larger institutions um, and, and larger sports facilities and whatever district would call us or school calls us. We'd be happy to help, but we didn't focus on it. But you know, as you well know, uh, there's been so many problems with schools um, in the last number of years, and especially this year. Um, the companies like hey Tom, we need you to really you know, drive this because it, it, it's an issue for schools. Um, but so really, I just started hitting the road in June and July and, and getting out there in different you know school security conferences and whatnot. Um, so it, it's really brand new, just getting out there. But a number of schools I can certainly give you references for. Um, honestly, mo <laughs> three quarters of them, though, at this point, I'll be honest with you, have been using them just for school board meetings. As crazy as it seems, um, as, as you guys, I'm, I'm sure know, there's been you know lots of threats, death threats, um, at school board meetings, and, and lots of not just on social media, but you know people at a school board meeting saying that I'll kill you to the superintendent and others, and say I got a gun in the car. So I've got a number of districts that called me to say, hey, can you FedEx me one? We've got a school board meeting next week. I need one. And that's the beauty of the open gate. We can do that and, and have it shipped and you can set it up in minutes. And, and the other benefit, uh, not just for school board meetings, but because the system is so portable and it takes a few minutes to boot up, but you saw how quickly you set it up in the video, uh, any sort of kind of uh, social media threat or anything that's perceived, if there's something at uh, DPW or Leo, uh, we could have them there like in a matter of minutes uh, to kind of check people coming in or a school board meeting. It would be pretty trivial to move it across town. They just have a handle and you pick them up. And Tom, I did want to ask on the Springfield ones, I think we're all kind of aware of the things that have been happening in Springfield lately. Uh, so they were going with the open gate or yeah, they're still discussing yeah they're looking they're having that same debate because when i demoed it was actually right after i saw you i was down there and you know because they did have that you know uh that student died because of the knife so we we absolutely had that discussion and and some were there um and saying yeah, we got to find knives and some were saying no it's just not common and so we're having that debate so they're looking at both our pmd2s which actually one in the background there that's a, this at a baseball stadium that's common for our, our, um, our professional sports teams uh, which is this, this column style here for outdoor use um, they're looking at some of those i've got some used ones that came back from the denver broncos because the broncos went with and, and other major teams so i've got some used ones so they're they're still having that debate so i've got quotes to them on both a traditional detector that we'll find you know again as small as half a razor blade or the open gate and they're just having that debate and actually they've got a board meeting i think next week to have that discussion can i ask one more sorry what's the life expectancy how long do these things last you know to, it's hard to say i mean you know it's a three-year warranty but i mean the tsa's had them for 20 years and they run 24 7. uh the nfl most of the stadiums have had them for you know 10 12 years um, the only time they really go bad, honestly, is like, you know, they put them on carts and, and move around and they fall off the back of a cart, you know, something like that. Other than that, they don't fail. Uh, they just don't. There's no maintenance on them. Now, you can get maintenance. And the only reason we do that is really for ensuring that they're all set properly, because what happens a lot of our uh, institutions is staff changes over 
and especially larger facilities that have you know hundreds of these, um, they have different settings at different doors, so it's inconsistent. So they ask us just to come out and, and recalibrate everything, make sure everything's set the same. But that's really the only maintenance we ever do. Again, unless you know, once in a blue moon, because it is electronic, something will go, but it's incredibly rare, incredibly rare. These things are designed to be outside. Again, our NFL stadiums in Cleveland and New York, Chicago that are outdoor, you know, in eight, you know, and uh, I don't know if you guys saw the Packer game the other night. Um, it was eight degrees, you know, freezing, and they have our detectors outside and they hold up. And as far as general reliability, uh, we were really impressed. They're very solid construction. Uh, if you guys got to kind of play around with them while they're here, and uh, Tom, even while one was here, kind of threw one to the ground and picked it back up uh, 60 seconds for it to recalibrate, and it was working again. So. Yeah, and they're designed, and the, the open gate is because of our work with uh, professional uh, leagues, um, they would often hose down that concrete that you see there, and, and ours would, they would hold up, but because of that, we said, well, let's make this one like 100% waterproof, which is designed for, you know, the water will flush out the bottom. So you literally take a hose to it, um, and we've done testing. The PGA had us out for three days straight in the rain uh, in Texas one day, and he's literally just out in the rain just like that, and, and they held up and still detecting. As people were walking through, and even the police officer couldn't believe it. He said, "Wait!" And then he walked with his gun and lit alarm, and they just they hold up. Um, and again, it's just after years and years of, of, of doing it. I'm assuming, I'm assuming the units must be. I mean, they're not plugged in, right? There must be batteries in them, and they're charged up, and there's gonna Correct. be life, there's gonna be life stay on the batteries. Yeah, right? and so the batteries. The great thing about <laughs> those, uh, which was I was really impressed when we got them. Uh, as we were unpacking them, I'm like, oh, these just take a standard, uh, I think it was a, was it a Milwaukee Makita battery correct. pack? So uh, off the shelf, uh, you could go buy a replacement battery pack at Lowe's uh, in 30 yeah, minutes. Yeah, so these are, that's right. And they run on, each tower runs on one battery. Um, and it automatically fails over to the other one uh, when one runs down. So you get about 10 and a half hours of life. Uh, but we just came out, we just released O2, where one of those batteries you can replace, it's, it's basically a, a power adapter uh, in place of that battery. So you can power it as well, but on four fully charged batteries, those will run about 10 and a half hours. But again, you can get backups and then just, you know, throw the backup battery in there, you know, too. So lots of options there. And also to that point, to have that flexibility, if you have a contentious football game and you want to bring it out to the football gate, you don't need to worry about power or wiring or network or anything. Or if you have, right. if you want to bring it to the soccer field or to the baseball diamond, it doesn't really require any additional infrastructure. You can just pick it up and be there in about three minutes. And we have some schools, uh, Hillsborough County, is one of the largest in the country, largest, one of the largest in Florida. Uh, they've been using our an older version of our mobile detector um, that came out, honestly, in the late 90s. And they do just random screenings at their high schools because um, they didn't want that look, you know, with a bunch of detectors in front of the school. So they've always just done random screenings. Um, and they'd want to clear a whole school um, in, in a day. And it would take them, honestly, about five hours to clear a school to have it checked, just like NYPD did. Uh, with these, they can clear a school in an hour, but just the portability, they throw it in the back of their SUV, they go over to school and clear it. They can be, they can take a, kids right off the bus and have them so they know when the kids get off the bus, they're not stashing anything in the, the bushes or in the trash or whatever. They have them come right off the bus, walk through right through the detector, kids clear it, then they have a dog or um, also an SRO, you know, go check the bus. Um, so there's all kinds of ways you can deploy this. Um, so don't think of it as your traditional detectors, walkthroughs that have to be, you know, at the front of the building. You've got lots of options. Right, uh, board members, ambassadors, any, any further? Anne. Yeah, I did have, I'm sorry to wait till the end. Um, I had a question about, to, to the end that you said they can be used in a different way. Um, 
when you in the presentation it says four to five machines so could you remind me please do you need the two towers next like to create a band gotcha. to be able to walk through you can't just use one tower yeah. on its own okay correct so, so just like the one can you still see my screen here yeah so this one here can you see my pointer i don't uh -huh. know if you can see my pointer yep so this one is our old one of our traditional detectors has a crossbar here so it's still two towers this just uses a new, uh, proprietary wireless technology, so we don't have to have that crossbar. But there's a, um, people don't realize it, but with electromagnetics and how this works, is one of the towers is sending a signal, and one of the towers is receiving a signal, and then doing the diagnostics and, and figuring out if there's a threat item. So that's why there's always two. Um, as far as how many you need, um, that's determined by, of course, you know, what are you trying to detect, um, but a general rule of thumb is we use you know, throughput. Um, so a traditional detector, um, because everyone has to pretty much take everything out of their pockets but their cell phone and, and keys and, and coins, um, you're not walking through a backpack with a traditional detector. Um, you can put about five to 700 people an hour through a single detector because they're slowing down. Because what will happen, as you, you well know, is you, you take stuff out of your pocket, you set it down, you walk through it alarm. And then you got, oh, shoot, I forgot this. And you got to you know, set something else back down and alarms. And you, we, we call that yo-yo. And you go back through until you clear. Um, so that takes time. With the open gate, you don't have that. Two, you, you change the process. You're not yo-yoing people. If it alarms, you send them over to secondary screening. But you don't have those um, uh, nuisance alarms, we call them. We don't call them false positives because if it alarms, it found metal. And so, so it just, is it a threat item? But we can, because of the discrimination technology, we can get about 2,000, 2,500 people an hour through a single open gate. So it replaces really four to five traditional detectors. So that's maybe where you got that number. Okay. Well, thank you for answering that question. Um, the reason why I asked um, just in general the number is that I mean, yes, we have many entrances to our schools, but I was also thinking about events that happen, especially during busy yep. sporting months when, say, in one weekend you could have a swim meet, which is at one, is in the Indoor Aquatic Center, which is a building at, at our campus is completely separate from our high school. You may have a basketball game going on that morning or a volleyball game or something. So you may have lots of different entrances that would pr supposedly need to be monitored because then you get into questions of equity of which – if we don't have yep. enough gates, which one deserves to be checked and which doesn't, and that's a big kettle of fish. But well, not just, and, and yeah, I can not jump just in that, on the, gets, the reason we quoted political. five. Uh, so we had, and we'll go through this a little bit later in the presentation, let the uh, let Tom off the hook here. Oh, uh, no, 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 but, yes. But we had kind of set up a use case where we were going to cover our main entrances, so door one, uh, door nine, and then door three, and five was kind of what led us to have average coverage or to have adequate coverage with this system at those three doors. Uh, also, because you have five, even if you had volleyball, basketball, uh, boys basketball, uh, all going on at the same time, swim meet, uh, you would be able to kind of allocate those uh, as, it, as you saw fit for those different okay. situations. Okay. Yeah, but you, and you did bring something up that you have to, you know, you do have to consider, or should consider, you know, um, you know, well, why did you, you know, why did you make kids do it at the basketball game, but not at the you know, swim meet, right? That's something you, get, you need to make sure, you, you know, you can address with, you know, the community, right? Well, and also, um, you know, venues like, say, if you went to a cross-country meet or a tennis match where they're out in the open and it's, it's not like you yeah. enter in one specific spot, which is not really for you to have to worry about. These are just thoughts in, in going in my head. And sure. my, my last question for Absolutely. you, though, that you can answer is um, – well, actually, no, it's not my last. I'm sorry. Bear with me. One of the questions was about upkeep because you, I know when you did it, the comparison with Evolve and OpenGate, they, you had presented that they go by lease and you go by a one-time purchase. But being realistic and being in the digital age where we get upgrades on phones and everything else digital so quickly, like how long do you need to go before you have to update any kind of software or wiring or technology and how much does that on average cost? And also – with the training of staff, I mean, what type of staff training would be required for this? What type of staff would be qualified to not only monitor this, but then do you have recommendations of what would happen if a weapon is confiscated 
in the worst case scenario by someone who doesn't want to give surrender it or someone who's belligerent or you know i mean is that wrapped into the training or do you guys just provide <laughs> bare bones training on how to read the detector and then you know how to maintain it I'll, yeah I'll there's a lot now. there so um a number of things so let's see where do i start well, let's start at the the, the end um you definitely want to um as far as if you find something, you want to leverage your SROs. Um, you do not want to get in the business of handling a gun. What do you do with that? Because now we've got a criminal, because you do have signs posted, I'm assuming, about you don't allow guns on campus, correct? Correct. Yeah, and it's, it's a crime, correct? Yes. Yeah, so that's when, so if you did find something, you want the SRO. As far as training goes, um, you know, as far as, and just like this person here in this video, to train this person, all this person is doing standing there is waiting for it to alarm. When alarms on somebody, that person's job, the only job they have is to push them over to somebody to do secondary, just like he did right there for secondary screening. You see that? So watch here, he's pushing him over. So you gotta go over for secondary screening. Let me check your bag. Let me check you out. That's it. And that's really honestly where the training comes in is um, right here. When it alarms, that's a simple job. The person manning that gate, and I can man easily three gates myself because they don't alarm very often, but it's the person that I'm sending them over to that now has to check that bag and then also hand wand the person to make sure they're clear as well. Um, because what the, the open gate is simply telling you is there could be a threat. That's its job. We detected a potential threat. Now you have to go find the threat. So the person standing there, that's not their job. The person there is just say, oh, we detected something. You need to go over secondary screening. So what most schools are doing for secondary screening is that could be a you know, security staff member. And then usually you're going to have an SRO, just like you have on staff, somewhere you know, readily available in case you do find something. Okay, but that's a policy uh, issue, but highly recommended. Um, and, and yes, that would you know, certainly be covered in training. But what training is mostly covering is detect, set up, detection, changing of settings, configuration, but also screening though. So as people walk through, how do you handle it? How do you handle secondary screening? So yes, that's, that's all involved. Um, you had another question in there that you started yeah, with. It was about um, the true cost of maintenance and up, ah. updating. Yeah. So software, by the way, those are all free upgrades. There's no, um, we don't charge you for that. The only time there would be an upgrade if there's a physical change. So for example, um, uh, right now we don't currently have modems on these. We do on the other words, so you can network them so we can get statistics on them and all kinds of things. So there's no modem on these. So that would be a hardware upgrade, but it's a tiny little modem that like goes in your phone. So it's not a big deal, but that would be a small, physical hardware upgrade, but software itself, we don't charge for software upgrades. Um, but it's only if um, you need that additional uh, technology that we're adding to it. So yes, we are always adding to our technology, but not always to the detector itself. Sometimes it's, we come out with a new detector like this. So usually we'll, you know, detectors usually have a life of at least 10 years. Some of ours have had life of 20 years. Um, so they definitely have a shelf life as far as um, technical capabilities, and we always try and carry that forward. So it's like, oh, the next the fresh produce is out next year. No, these again, TSA has been using them, same ones for 20 years. Um, and I will so add on that. Uh, I don't think we really touched on it here because uh, it's more of a configuration thing. But there is, they all connect through a mobile app. So as far as configuring them for if you want to detect more things or less things or kind of setting them up. Uh, that all runs through the mobile app, and it's all pretty seamless. Thank you. Hey, John, can you, um, one consideration that came up with the crisis committee um, when we were looking at the other system was supervision in terms of the number of um, people, manpower that would be needed to man the other um, system that we were looking at. And the diff I mean, he just said it that he can watch three of these at one time so i don't know if you want yeah. to address that and absolutely uh the other ones uh because they were a lot more kind of they required a lot more intent attention as you were walking through so 
if you had two dual gate systems, you would need several people watching to see where on what person, what was alarming. And then as we're directing them to the secondary screening, you would need several people at the secondary screening to identify where on each person what they were looking for wanding. Uh, these ones, it's not that. So instead of having, I think the other ones for the two, for door number one, say, we had kind of estimated it was gonna take around four to five people, minimum to minimum. Uh, as we were walking through uh, looking at this, it was closer to two to three people depending on traffic volumes. Again, a lot less training, a lot simpler. So uh, I know uh, UHS has just hired some more SRSs, thankfully. Uh, I know they need them, uh, but these are things where you're watching them come through and the light turns red, the SRSs can direct them to secondary screening where you could have an AP or the SRO kind of working on the secondary screening, but you're not gonna need half a dozen people uh, manning door one as they come in. Since we're already short on staff, that was another of the bigger selling points for me. And also in the video um, that Tom showed us where the person was walking through with all the metal items that did not alarm, if you notice, there was a green light that went off. So there's a visual indicator. It turns green or red. And there's also a sound. So we get to control how loud the sound is. Um, Tom did a couple different demos when he was here. He demoed the, at Central Office. Um, we demoed over at UMS with the crisis team. Um, so you can see the green light there. But the sound is the other indicator, too. So I know at door one, it, we have a lot of students who come through in the morning. So I think in the morning, we could have the sound turned up a little bit more because it's noisier, right? You've got a couple hundred kids coming through that door in 30 minutes. Um, but then for the remainder of the day, we could have the sound turned down or off and just use the green light. So it is nice to have that option to have the visual as well as the sound. So That's, and, that's correct. Yeah. Great, great point. So yes, you could turn that. So that's one thing John mentioned, the mobile app. That's really what the mobile app is for, is for changing those kinds of settings. You don't need it to operate it, just to configure it. Um, but you're absolutely right. You could do that. Exactly what you said. Turn it up when it's noisy and lots going on and turn it down or actually off later in the day. And that's when you use the mobile app, though, is maybe because you can have it vibrate, your, your phone vibrate, um, or just tone on your phone and not on the detector itself. But the lights will always alarm. So, yes, you can turn off the sound at the detector, um, but you'll always see the lights. And also in one of the kind of configurations, uh, you can actually have it kind of have staged alarms. So there's kind of a quieter alarm if it's yep. something smaller metal and then if the gun that that guy just walked through with it would be a lot louder alarm and the light would kind of uh, flash strobe all right any further questions for for the open gate representative all right hearing none thank you very much tom you're welcome take right. care and moving on with the rest of the presentation so yes thank you everyone um Todd, can you do me a favor? Because this next part of this presentation is going to inco involve numbers. Can you move the TV forward a little bit more for Brenda and Brian, who are over here, just so they can see the start the bar chart, a uh, little chart. Um, I would like to invite Mr. Nance up to the table as as um, here representing UHS. And in our Zoom, we have Assistant Principal uh, Julie. They are both members of the crisis. Uh, team and they have had the benefit of being part of a couple demos here and um, I know they have some opinions on the system as well as the fact that we're going to be looking at survey data here um, and they have been talking with students and staff um, and so I wanted them to be available to answer questions as well as share their opinions. We have shared a little bit with the student uh, ambassadors so I'm sure if they have an opinion they'll jump in at any point. So um, we are going to flip here to our survey. So in our last discussion with the board, um, of course, staff of voice and student voice were very important. Um, again, we've talked multiple times that always a survey is not the best uh, way to get information, but we did the best that we could to uh, get our staff members to 
complete the survey. Um, we shared the survey with students uh, via email. Um, I took paper copies over uh, Ms. Blixen also and Mr. Nance. Uh, during lunch periods, we had paper copies available for students who anonymously would like to uh, fill these out during their lunch periods. So I am actually impressed that we had 323 students uh, even chime in on a uh, survey and we had 84 staff members from UHS. So that's about half of the uh, staff member um, ratio there. So we'll keep going here. Um, we have kind of combined this to make it much easier to read, but the, the staff and the students were asked the same questions. Uh, they were asked if they strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. So what we've done is combined agree and strongly agree to show the blue line and uh, strongly disagree and disagree uh, agree were combined as well. So we've just shown you the two indicators there. So um, again, staff and students were asked the exact same questions. We wanted to compare apples and apples um, as we kind of looked at this information. So the very first question we asked was, do we feel safe at school? Um, you can see our students are, are feeling pretty safe. Um, our staff, only about 60% of those folks who completed the survey feel safe at school. We didn't go into why or whatever reason, we just really wanted to just in general know what their thoughts were on that. Um, I feel my school has enough safety and security plans in place and that can include anything. We're not just asking here about um, looking for weapons. We're also thinking about supervision and um, how we're doing with our drills. So students, um, you can see uh, about a little about 45% of our students or 50% of our students agree that um, they do feel that we have enough security and safety in place. Um, our staff, not as much, but a, a little over uh, it's about 65, closer to 70% of our staff I uh, don't feel that we have uh, enough safety and security in place. I have concerns that students may have weapons in school or outsiders could bring weapons into the school. So this was a question that John referenced earlier. So if you see the staff there, our staff members strongly agree with this. They over 75% of our staff members have concerns that we may have students walking around in our buildings uh, with weapons. That's something we've talked about here. Um, I've shared my concerns about that. I know the high school administration has concerns about that. Um, and it, it sounds like our staff echoes that. Um, our students, a little over half of those 323 students also feel that um, there may be students uh, that have weapons in school and we don't know that. And we don't know because uh, we have no way to detect that or on the other side um, that they are concerned that people could be walking into our buildings with weapons and we don't know. A metal detector would make me feel safer at school. So if you look at our staff number there, um, almost 70% of our staff feel like this would make them feel safer if we had some kind of detection system in place. Um, for our students, uh, about half of our students, this is a kind of 50-50 was pretty common for our students. Uh, about half of our students disagree with that and uh, about 40% of them do agree with that. I would be in support of a door detection system at school. So almost 80% of our staff members who completed the survey um, are in agreement with that. They would support a door detection system at school. Um, for our students, again, it's kind of split. Um, you know, they are about half and half on that, um, um, supporting the door detection at school. Questions on the survey before we go into yeah, some I, of the, yeah. Who, who are the students we're talking about? Do we know we, demographically? Do we know? Um, no, we did not ask that question. We didn't want to, we just wanted to leave it as open as possible. We didn't ask for the staff either. So, um, you know, I can tell you personally with the students that completed the paper surveys was it was just a wide range of any any kid. I sent the email out to every single grade level. Mr. Nance shared the email. Um, Ms. Blixen also collected paper surveys. So, um, yeah, we just we didn't ask that question. Kind of purposefully, we just wanted to leave it open to 
um, not gauge our uh, viewpoint. We just wanted to ask any student what they thought. Yep. Um, Come on in. So uh, this first slide, I'm, um, I'm quite pleased with uh, the number for students. Um, that speaks to the climate and culture that we're trying to establish at uh, Urbana. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about, I looked at the staff versus the students on this slide, was the fact that uh, I was thinking about when do staff travel the most in the building? That's when they arrive to school. Once they arrive to school, they're in their classrooms the entire day versus the students. They're traveling every period and doing lunch. So the fact that we have over, I have my glasses on because they're fogging up, we have that high of a number of students feeling safe in our school just speaks to the fact that, you know, we are working very hard every period doing lunches to make sure that they feel safe in the school. I can understand the staff's um, percentage because if there's an incident involving the staff, if it's just one staff, we do uh, send out information. We let the staff uh, know what's going on. And so that one time, that one incident can have lingering effects because you're in your classroom by yourself the entire day with students going in and out. So I can understand the uh, staff's a uh, little less, but I'm quite pleased with the students, um, 323 students um, having that have that much faith and confidence in our, in our staff and what we do. I do have one more question about the actual numbers. Um, sure. I, I'm guessing you don't have a breakdown of the, the makeup of the staff, but did this survey go out to substitutes? Did it go out to it like- It went out to the UHS staff list. So all anyone of who is on the UHS staff okay. list, that would include long-term and building-based subs. Okay. Not random subs who okay. just sub in the building every now and then, but any sub assigned to UHS would have also received this, yes. Because Mr. Nance made a good point about the staff traveling to and from school and then being in the classrooms, but then when you deal with custodial staff or sure. other, you know, assistant staff or subs or people who are walking around a lot, that kind of mixes it up a little bit, so they might have a slightly different response. But it's sure. obviously we want to keep it anonymous, so we'd have no way of knowing exactly who would be. Mm -hmm. To be clear, though, my, oh, sorry, my question was not so much about the the breakdown of who's answering what, but when I see a number like 323, which is a pretty darn good response, yeah. mm -hmm. we still don't know, is it all the freshmen and none of the seniors? Is it all white kids? Is it not? Like, you mm -hmm. know, so understanding just descriptively who we're talking about here for me, it's super important to know who's feeling safe if we know roughly who we've got, uh, uh, as opposed to, well, I, like I've seen who I think is taking the survey. So, I mean, I guess from a suggestion point of view, we don't have to see the data broken down that way, but just knowing whose voice is being heard sure. and whose voice is not being heard, to me, is super important when we're talking about an issue of safety in the building. So we do, um, we did have a comment but if I showed you the 300 comments, we, you'd be able to um, gauge that there was a lot of diversity. Um, you know, we have some Latino voices for sure um, uh, engaged in the comments. I'm happy to share the comments with board members, um, you know, through their responses. Um, some of the comments were very telling of, of uh, situations and experiences that the students have had that um, made them answer the questions that they did the, in the way that they did. So I, I'm happy to share those. Um, we had some students who uh, are a little apprehensive and mentioned in the comments, you know, they don't want anything that makes this feel like a prison to them. But um, they understand that it is in, in, in unfortunate in the, in the world that we live in like right now that we're even having this conversation. So. Um, the comments were a little interesting. I think we can share those with you, Brian, because I think that will, we, you know, we know we have several African American, I mean, many, many African American students um, who made comments about gunshots in their neighborhoods and things that are happening in their um, um, communities where they don't feel safe. And when they come to school, they want to feel safe. They don't want to feel like they feel, you know, they might be at home versus when I'm in school, I don't want to worry about those things. And so that came through pretty clearly in some of the comments. So what period of time, I guess, were you collecting surveys? I mean, was this from a month ago or is this from six weeks ago? Um, we collected all the way up until winter break. So I think the last, um, right after the, um, our last discussion here with the board, uh, we created the survey and we started sharing it out. Um, so I'd say this was 
probably, I could go back and look at the very first email, but I think we sent it out to students and staff the last time, probably the week right before we got out of break, maybe. I, I wanted to add, Jennifer, if I could. Sure. Um, this, is, this is Julie talking. Um, in the comments, it talked a lot about not wanting to be inconvenienced and having to wait in lines. Um, a lot that was a lot of the comments of students, but with this system, it, I think they're thinking of the airport where you have to take everything out. Um, and with this system, you don't have to do that. So I just wanted to add that as, as some of the comments that I saw a lot of. So yeah, I just had a I just wanted to clarify. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is Lara. I, I just wanted to clarify too that the expectation is that all staff, um, would also be going through the um, open gate, right? Yeah. So it's all staff, all students, there wouldn't be any exceptions. Cause I just want, I feel like as a student, I would wanna clarify that and just make sure that it's everyone's on the same page. Oh, absolutely. Um, we have a slide here where, and John already addressed it. We would have it basically at every single doorway. So every entrance that staff would come in with students, everyone would walk through as well as visitors. Um, to the building throughout the day, they would also um, have to walk through, so yes. And Jennifer, can I add to that, that mm -hmm. all staff and students are, are also, we bought um, ID scanners that they're going to be scanning in so that they, so we know who is in the building so that if an incident did occur, we would have an accurate count of who's in the building and an accurate record of who's in our building at all times which I think is really important, especially considering what just happened in Michigan and you know, just thinking of all these things that just happened, and making sure we have an accurate count of who is in our building at all times um, and having students have to wear their IDs so that we know that they're students and they're supposed to be in our building, which I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Other questions about the survey before we move on? Okay, so um, again, as, as John mentioned at the beginning of our discussion this evening, um, you know, the board kind of charged us with uh, looking at other companies, um, doing our due diligence to um, not only bring something forward that we felt was, um, would, you know, intentionally work for our, what, we, what we needed to do, but also be cost effective and um, efficient for our use. So. This is just a kind of lineup comparison between the Evolve program, which we um, looked at previously, and then OpenGate, which is what we're talking about here tonight. So um, as you heard, we, are we would be able to purchase the OpenGate. I think that is one of the biggest concerns that we had um, for the price point, the fact that we would not have even owned the Evolve machines. We would be leasing them for four years. Of course, the cost would be a lot cheaper if we leased them for one year, two year, three year. Um, but the fact that we would be able to purchase the open gate systems and have them, um, and again, as the uh, as Tom mentioned, the life expectancy, um, you know, if we can keep those for 10 years, we've definitely um, paid back our $65,000 uh, if we're able to keep those and keep them working as long as, um, he mentioned that they are um, able to do what they need to do. Um, initial training and setup were included with both systems. Um, we talked a little bit about staffing earlier. Um, staffing was a concern um, when we were talking about this with Evolve, especially with the crisis committee. Um, when we were initially talking um, about it, uh, Julie and the UHS team were still hiring SRSs and um, we were concerned about the number of super, the amount of supervision that would be pulled from other areas of the building just to utilize those. Um, but with the open gate, as you've heard tonight, uh, there is uh, a much less supervision involved and staffing um, needed at those uh, doorways, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, installation and shipping much faster. I mean, uh, the Evolve system and again other districts have been jumping on board with Evolve so initially they told us six to eight weeks and I would guess now we would be beyond that um, because they have been shipping them out to other districts um, but the open gate we get them a lot faster 
um, and we would have a minimal setup. And um, the ability to relocate them is really uh, a big deal for us too, that we can pick them up and move them um, so easily and readily throughout the day or after school or before school or for a special event. And just to touch on a couple more things on this slide, uh, just so you guys have a good apples to apples, I don't want to seem like the thumbs on one scale. So the reason, so you see on the uh, Evolve side, that had four dual gate systems. So it would have been eight total versus the five single gate systems. This kind of based on the geometry and how things were laid out uh, with doors one and nine uh, and three, the main student entrances, uh, you ended up kind of with the dual gate systems just because they're a little bit narrower, but they also kind of straddle like two doors. Uh, that's just kind of what we thought we needed for this use scenario to cover those doors. Uh, and then uh, for the three to five weeks, six to eight weeks, uh, I did talk to Tom a little bit earlier and it, he said probably uh, closer to the three weeks, they've been dealing with some kind of bigger orders depending on what they're doing across the state in Springfield and some of the other places, uh, things that they have in the pipeline. It's possible that it would get pushed back, but probably uh, a little closer on the three week side. Okay. And one other thing uh, on the Evolve system for the installation, uh, what we had talked about was they don't really have anything that kind of holds them to the floor. So we had talked about kind of drilling mounts into the floor, uh, which we were kind of trying to figure out. I know on the door three hallway, on that upper hallway, it has that kind of beautiful 100 year old tile. So we had talked about kind of some other options for that. The Evolve system, it has kind of industrial suction cups. And once you suction cup it there, it's just kind of permanently there. So it wouldn't require any uh, uh, any renovating to the building or drilling holes in the building. They do have some base plates if there's places for sports where you kind of set out a base plate, which is a metal plate, and then it sets on that. And one other point, um, Tom didn't mention this, but when we had our demo, we discussed it. Um, Mr. Waller, who's part of the uh, crisis committee, was concerned with durability. Like when we, when that huge group of students is coming through door one, um, with the Evolve system, um, one, because there's, they were a little high tech or more high tech and um, I am being a little biased, I don't, I think we were nervous that a duffel bag or a backpack or, you know, the big bags that the kids bring through, um, that they would get jostled and, and bump more. Um, but when Open Gate was here demoing, one of the uh, arms or bars was even knocked down and it still worked. Um, and so that was something that we thought they will get bumped quite a bit when students are walking through there um, first thing in the morning. Um, so we don't want to be replacing them because they're being damaged. Um, but the open gate one did seem very durable. So what doors are we talking about? John has kind of talked about this a little bit, but our priorities are door one, which is our main entrance there on Iowa Street, uh, door nine and Tyler Lane. Um, we always would have a uh, detection system set up there throughout the day. Um, students that are arriving late to school, um, after, is it 8.10 or 8.15, you can't come through door one, is that right, Mr. Mayor? 18. Eight, okay, 8.10, and so then everyone is redirected to door nine, so we would be using these pretty heavily at door nine as well. Um, door three is the race street entrance. That is where all of our students who utilize MTD um, enter the building. Um, so we would be using them at all three of our main entrances. Uh, we've already talked about sporting events, so I won't really belabor that point, but we definitely would be utilizing them there. Um, I've had conversations with Dr. Wiemelt and his team. Um, they're also part of the crisis committee uh, and they, are, they have asked um, you know, should, if we were to uh, approve this for UHS, would there be a point where we uh, would be considering this for UMS? But um, the nice thing also about the open gate system is because we can move it so quickly, um, if there were social media threats or if there were any points where we had concerns, um, we could pick them up and 
with the number that we're purchasing, we can move them over to the middle school. We could have one at the main entrance at the middle school, door six, door seven, door eight. Um, no, not door six, seven, sixth grade door, seventh grade door, eighth grade door. Um, that would have been extremely helpful um, for us when we had to lock the school down when we were looking for a weapon. Um, we would have been able to just quickly move these over to UMS um, and have students walk through them and students wouldn't even have known that we were doing that. Um, we could do some random screenings when we saw, you know, once a month, we could pick them up and move them over to the middle school pretty easily. Um, after UHS is done at 810, we would have enough time to literally pick them up and move them over if we needed to. Or um, So I think it just gives us a lot more flexibility to be able to um, have some targeted safety measures in place for UMS when we need them, um, but not have to spend another hundred thousand dollars or have them at the uh, middle school every day all, all the time. Yeah, and I think even we would find with kind of maybe one or two random screenings at UMS a semester that the incidence of mm -hmm. students bringing uh, items that they shouldn't to the school would drop dramatically if they even had the inkling that yeah. I could show up on a Wednesday and uh, I would kind of have to answer for what's in my backpack that day. Tom kind of addressed some of the other district-wide screening opportunities. Hopefully we would never be bringing them to board meetings. I thought that was kind of interesting <laughs> that so many districts are doing that. Um, but we do have a lot of district-wide events uh, where we might want to utilize them um, for, you know, for other events or, or performances and things like that. So with that, I've got the last slide done. No, next step. So um, next steps, we are really hoping. Um, we've been talking about this for a while. We've been talking about it as a crisis team. Uh, we've been talking about it as administrative teams with the middle school and the high school. Um, we're really needing the board to make a decision one way or the other because at this point, um, if we are not going to move in this direction, then we need to come up with some other mitigation measures and plans because we know that we have students with weapons in our school. So if we're not going to move in this direction, then our team, uh, we need to sit down and come up with some other plans um, sooner rather than later. So uh, we're asking for uh, uh, some information from the board tonight about what your thoughts might be. Um, and then at our business meeting, we'd like to uh, following the board's de decision tonight, um, put an ask and um, on the agenda for approval for either the Evolve system or the Open Gate system. Um, we would be able to then finalize equipment, uh, talk about a communication plan for our families and staff, um, work out a training plan uh, with, 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 with whatever company we decide to go with, um, and really think about when we would be able to roll these out to the students. All right, board, uh, John, could you put the board members back up on the screen so I could, they could visually indicate if they wish to address the board? Thank you. Great. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, I guess I think at this point, one of my concerns or just questions is, is kind of that last point you were talking about, Dr. Ivory Tatum, is the communication rollout. Um, seeing the numbers of the survey, I, you know, I think that's fantastic we got that much, but I know that's not a lot. I know that still there's still a bunch of folks that are um, potentially not aware of this decision. Um, and I guess also just kind of concerned with, um, I sort of have the image of the uh, Washington Post that Tom showed about guns in schools, which is super sensationalizing um, some of the trauma. So thinking long-term of like, we move these into our schools, how does media respond where it doesn't become, uh, I don't know, the next popular thing to talk about in a negative way or demoralizing groups of people. So I guess that's my question is kind of what does that rollout of communication look like? Sure, so I don't, I, I didn't mention this, but I'm going to, because I think Laura's question kind of leads me into it. So unit four set theirs up on Monday and 
Um, I watched the news yesterday and uh, listened to reports, and I saw um, nothing that really led me to sensationalizing. I, I think I heard Rob. I didn't see Ravi's uh, comments today, but um, just in what I looked at yesterday, um, it looked like it was pretty seamless in the rollout, I think um, their students were expecting it and we would do something similar. We would not just randomly put them there. We would make sure um, students were aware, um, staff were aware. Uh, we'd make sure that they would know what the expectations would be for the Chromebooks, which is um, something we'd have to kind of talk to students about and model that and so they knew um, when they walked in, they'd have to take their Chromebooks out, things like that. So. Um, we would message it in all the different ways that we've been messaging, texting, email. Um, Ms. Fernandez has been doing a great job communicating with families at the high school, so we would rely on him and his team to get um, as much communication out as possible. Any other questions, comments, discussion? I have a question. Go ahead, Robbie. All right, uh, on that uh, cost slide for the open gate, is that $65,000 per gate or total for five gates? That's the total purchase price for five gates. It was, yeah. uh, we got a substantial discount, uh, but it was, I think, 12 four per gate. Yeah. So it's like the quantity brings down the price if you buy more than one? Uh, yeah. I think we got a, there were several discounts. There were some for being an educational institution. And uh, so just kind of like talking with them about our needs and uh, they kind of know where we're at, so. All right, well, then my comment then is that for, um, you know, for $65,000, that's really not that much in the scheme of the budget. And, you know, like we talked about flooring costing $127,000 last month. So that's really not that much for a price. But uh, the question I have really is what good is it going to do? So it's going to stop somebody with a weapon of, you know, mass casualty. Now, my take is a person with a weapon of mass casualty is just going to walk through. And when you say go to secondary screening, sir, they'd be like, no, I'm shooting the place up, you know, so that person is coming through regardless. So what you're potentially going to do is just train the students that want to fight to bring in exacto blades and other small knives, uh, which uh, does not seem like a good idea to me. So uh, I totally would go along with buying these gates for $65,000 because the cost is so low. So if it gives some people peace of mind, then that's good. But I don't think it's actually going to reduce any of the fighting in the school. I think that's still going to go on. And uh, it's just going to potentially tell people to bring in other weapons that will not be detected. And then the other part is, you know, Dr. Avery Tatum said if we were to vote against this, then her crisis team would look at other mitigation efforts. I think you still need to do that because you probably need additional mitigation efforts for this to help people actually be safe in school, not just feel safe. Absolutely. And we've looked at things like clear backpacks, which, um, you know, that that is a, a little more challenging than it sounds uh, in a building of our size and scope and, um, you know, the amount of time it takes our students to travel around. Um, so, yes, Ravi, I agree. We, we will continue to talk about other um, other measures. Um, you do bring up a good point that I did not um, we did not really address on the slide is where where would we um, where would the funding come from? Um, so, you know, we secure working cash funds and part of working cash is uh, security and safety. So we would, um, whatever system we go with, we'd utilize our working cash funding um, to pay for these. So, Ms. Fernandez, were you going to make a comment? Um, I, I will say um, I do agree with uh, our board member that, uh, you know, just having an open gate isn't going to solve the problem. So uh, my priority was relationship building. I think that's the key to all of this. Um, so even the kids who were impacted by the recent tragedy, when they came to school, one of the things they mentioned, which was in some of the comments, is that they feel safe at school. Um, and they, they, even though they're traumatized and, you know, have a lot of things going on mentally, the first thing they want to do to come to school to see Ms. Hammond, to see me. And so just having those relationships that we've built um, every day, talking to kids and 
you know, I'm going in the classrooms ever since September, mentioning safety and security. I've already laid the foundation that, you know, this may be coming down the pipeline for our families and our and the community. So um, it shouldn't be a surprise to many because I'm communicating constantly in our stand-up staff meetings, just talking about safety and the fact that the district committee is uh, working to put other things in place. But that relationship, that one-on-one -on -one conversations, those those moments in the cafeteria in the hallway when we're talking to kids, what I'm scheduling my whole day with students just to talk to them about different things, I think that's led to the reason why so many students do feel safe. And I think that this is just one more layer um, in our toolbox for safety. So, But I do agree that this is just this is not going to stop, and we need to continue to make sure that we're having that positive climate and culture in our schools. Anyone else? Ann. <sighs> Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up a big, long philosophical discussion here, but we have to have it. Um, I mentioned this at a previous meeting when we had our last vendor come, and um, I mentioned that this discussion has to be coupled with a discussion of the SROs, because as this uh, gentleman, um, salesperson, just told us, the SRO is going to have to be crucial in um, diffusing or confiscating anything that comes through. And my question at, at several previous meetings ago was, well, then that kind of locks us into having to have an SRO of some capacity in our school. And I think we need to take care of both at the same time. My concern with the metal detectors is not that the, I know that, the, that we have threats to our school. I think Ravi made some great points about it's not going to stop fights. And Mr. Nance also brought up the great point about relationship building. I worry that we haven't done enough research and due diligence into exactly does metal detection really reduce crime or weapons or violence or threats of any sort. And I, it's, it's sort of, it's kind of in conjunction with the study of SROs too in a way and it's like I want to see data that proves that these things really are doing what they say they do and over the long term they have reduced incidents of violence. And that is why I, I'm hesitating because I don't want to keep putting money towards a problem without knowing 100% that it will work. I know, for example, that relationship building does work. I know that when we spend money on staff, support staff, and clinical professionals who can help our kids work through trauma and other problems that are causing them to create the violence or bring in weapons, that does work. We know for a fact that that works. We have data to prove it over the long term. I like to move in that direction with money that we're going to spend rather than, I mean, whether you feel safe and whether you are safe are two different things. And that survey actually kind of confused me with two of the responses. It was a large proportion of, of staff said, I already feel safe here. But the very next question was, could we do more? And they're like, yeah, but we're not doing enough. And that kind of is like a little cognitive dissonance in my head is like, but if you feel safe, then why do you feel like we need to add more? And is metal detection going to be that thing? We haven't dug down enough to know if that's exactly what it's going to do. And I, the reason why I asked about funding to our salesperson is even though we're going to pay a, fa a flat fee with this particular detection system, there's always cost involved. And it's not necessarily hardware cost. It's personnel cost. For example, at sporting events, if the SRO has to be at three places at once or at the school doors if something's detected at the Iowa Street and then something, you know, Lord forbid, gets detected at another door, how do we coordinate people running back and forth to make sure that those weapons get done? Those are little logistical things that go through my head. And so I would really like us to be able to drill down more before we have to take a vote on this. I agree with Ravi saying that despite which way we go with metal detectors, we still need to keep researching other ways to mitigate this. And I just I'm not, I'm not saying forget about it. I'm a no. I'm saying, please, can we do more research before we spend money on something that we're not 100% sure is really going to work? We can do the research, but I am, I am going to significantly push back right now. And I, I'm just going to say that before I. So 75% of our staff members feel that students have weapons in school. More than 50% of our kids feel like students have weapons in school. We can do all the research we want, but this is real life. And we have people telling you, board, our students have weapons in school. And I, that, that's all I'm going to say. So we can research. We can pull up articles. We can do all of that. But if we're not, if we're going to continue to bury our heads in the sand and not realize what is happening in our community, we lost a student to gun violence who walked through our doors all fall, and several of his friends were present when he was killed. And they have been coming to school every day. 
How do you think those young men feel? They're concerned about retaliation. There is so much going on. I can't even begin to go into detail here on a public meeting, but our students are telling us this. Our staff are saying it. Our administrators are saying it. We can research this for six more months, but how many more shootings do we have to talk about or work through or trauma and work with the trauma related to this before we make a decision? That's all I'm gonna say. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up, Jennifer, and I, I'm not trying to sound callous about the student we lost last week. That's devastating. Oh, Absolutely and I beyond. wasn't meaning that. And, but, I mean, is, does that mean that more students are going to bring weapons to the school as a result of something they that They already in are, and they're walking around with the weapons now. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying it's that. Our students have access to guns. I, mean I'm, I do not doubt that for a second. I absolutely do not. And I'm not trying to bed, bury my head in the sand. I'm just, I, I'm trying to listen to everybody. I know that there are people who are feeling very scared and there are people who are not. Or there are people who are feeling scared for the opposite reason that other people are feeling scared. You know what I mean? Some people feel scared because there are weapons in the school. Some people feel scared because there are, you know, there are people who, I don't know, I mean, even the, the having an SRO with a weapon counts as a weapon being in school. And we heard last year and the year before that that there were students who were worried about that. So I am trying really hard to assimilate everything that I hear from everybody. And I want, I just want to know that we make the right decision about this. And I, one thing I didn't ask also is that you mentioned Unit 4 rolling out their machines on Monday. How many other schools in our district already use them? How long have they had them? Not in our, just in our district, but nearby. I mean, you know, Rantoul, Danville, uh, Decatur, um, you know, other places around the area, Bloomington Normal, places like that who are close by or is similar in size. If they have them, have they, have they helped in any way? Can we, can we hear about that, you know? Sure we can, but this is not Rantoul. This is not Bloomington. This is Urbana. And we have students losing their lives. We have students being shot. I, I, I could bring you, maybe next meeting I'll bring you the number of our students who have been immediately connected to gun violence, whether it was a sibling, a family member, themselves. Um, we are patching up kids emotionally, physically, on a daily basis because of the gun violence that is happening in our community. It is a real thing. I we know can't compare <laughs> ourselves to Bloomington and Normal and Rantoul. We have to deal with what's happening right here in our own backyard in our community. And I, and I don't want to, um, I, I, I don't want to address your, your philosophical uh, SRO piece, but this is not about the SRO. The SRO cannot be at four doors at one point anyway. We are going to have to train our staff. We're going to have to uh, utilize our administrators. We're going to have to utilize our SRSs. Um, and the people who are managing these stations will have to be trained on what to look for. We're not expecting yeah. SRO Burnett to run from door one to door nine to door three every time the, the uh, system pings or alarms. We will have to train multiple people to be able to do that. I'm, I'm thinking 20 to 25 because uh, Mr. Waller has different events. He has different crews. So between his crew and Ms. Blix's crew, it would be about 20 to 25, adding with the admin. So uh, we'll, we'll definitely have multiple people uh, being able, and we'll walk out scenarios. We'll, we'll plan out a whole training to make sure that every scenario possible we can we can uh, role play to make sure that we know how to respond when it happens. Absolutely. That, that's just the one point I wanted to bring out, Ann, is that regardless of whether or not this, this board in the future dec decides to extend a contract with the Urbana Police Department for an SRO, the need for somebody to perform the types of actions that that individual does, whether it's, it's uh, searches or other it's, it's, it's certain kind of security. The, the, the district would have to fulfill that obligation in another way. What, it's going to be done somehow, whether or not it's an SRO. Okay, well, that's, and I'm glad you answered that too, because that was a question that I wanted to have answered, and thank you. And actually, uh, we are under a contract, was it three years or five with the SROs? Um, I can't remember. It ends this summer. It, it ends, it yeah, ends, it ends after okay. this, this thank semester. Thank you. I couldn't remember the date on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I just like to say, you know, just off the bat, I'm um, in support of the open gate. Um, I think we need to stop um, saying that, you know, this will not work 100% because quite frankly, nothing works 100% ever. <laughs> um, you know, we're not considering this for a reduction in fights. That's just 
you know, do metal detectors to reduce the amount of fights that you're going to have in a school. So you do have to have all those, all of the other pieces in, which I think is a piece of what we're doing in many different facets, whether it's hiring more staff to be around the building, building relationships. Um, all of those different pieces are very important. I call them puzzle pieces. And without all of these puzzle pieces, it's, it's just not going to work in general. Um, you don't know how many people are not bringing a gun to school today because of the metal detector, and you're never going to have those numbers again. It's just a reality. It's the same thing with the SRO. You don't know how many kids don't do certain things because there's an SRO in the building. You don't know how many kids don't bring weapons in a school because there's, there's an SRO in the building, and you're never going to have those stats. It's just, <laughs> it is what it is. We can sit here for the next two or three months and talk about let's study this and, and and I'm not knocking the studies because I think studies and surveys are important to an extent. At some point we've got to say we have a lot more information as administrators and as board members than our public has. So obviously their perception is going to be different than ours. We have more s information than our students have. They only get bits and pieces of what they see. They don't know the reality of everything that's happening that we know as administrators and board members. And so at some point we have to say, we know that there are weapons in the school and so if we're not gonna do this to deter, what are we gonna do? I'd love to hear what we're gonna do. Because we can sit and say, no, this is not gonna be 100%, no, this is maybe not gonna work. Yes, someone's gonna come in at, uh, potentially with mass destruction, but quite frankly, that could happen anywhere. And if a person really, really wants to come and shoot up a school, yeah, they're going to do it. Again, that's not the person that we're really thinking about when we're saying we're putting a door detection in. We're thinking about that kid that's bringing the school, the gun to school because they feel like someone's going to shoot me today. And I got to be ready. Or I'm going to get him or her because they got my homie last night. And I think the hard part for me, and maybe even for Jennifer, Jennifer's in a different neighborhood, but she is deals with our kids, is that what you see on the news and happening in our community is the big stuff. You don't hear about the little stuff too much. They're, they don't report on, oh, there was gunshots last night, you know, on, on Lincoln Avenue, or on, you hear about it if it's somewhere like Texas Roadhouse, <laughs> you know. But you don't hear about what's happening in the neighborhoods, and, and I doubt that it's happening very often in your neighborhood. And so in your perception of what you're thinking, it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, we've got stuff going on, but it's not, at some point, it's going to enter the schools. Whether we want it to or not, we know the weapons are there. We, the kids are telling us, one thing, what else do we need? What else do we need? What am I going to say? No, you're lying? <laughs> how, do, how do I... How do I take that information when a kid is telling me there are guns in the school and ignore that and not do something about it and then deal with something when it does happen, when a kid does get shot? Then how do I come back and say, well, what did I do as a board member after I got that information from multiple kids to say there are guns in the school, what did I do with that information? If I did nothing? That kid's life was on me, potentially, because I didn't do nothing about it. So if it's not going to be this, which for me, this is something. This, it, it may not be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. I can tell you it's not. It's not going to catch every single thing. We are going to have to do other things, but we've got to show we're doing something about the guns because the guns is what is the problem in our community right now. Maybe not in yours, but definitely in mine. So I, I am in favor of open gate. I don't have any, any second guessing. I don't want another darn study. <laughs> I don't care what Rantoul is doing. I don't care what Bloomington is doing. I live in Urbana. I am charged with Urbana kids. And I'm saying let's go for this. Let's continue to have conversations about other things that we can do to prevent the gun violence in our community, to restore our children, to make sure our teachers and staff feel safe, even if it's just a feeling of feeling safe. 
a feeling of walking in the door and feeling safe for me mentally as a teacher is going to give me a different direction in my day than if I'm worried about Johnny, who I heard had a fight last night with Jimmy, who maybe might have a gun in my classroom today. My, my perception, my teaching is going to be different that day if I walked in and I felt like I was safe. Even if there's potentially that hairline potential that a gun maybe did still enter the school, I'm going to feel better. And for $65,000 and the conversation, buy it. Yep. Yeah. And that, that's kind of where I am on too. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you amortize the cost of, say, it's a 10-year lifespan for these devices, you're talking about $6,500 a year. If we lose one less teacher a year to attrition because they feel safer in the building, that pays for itself as far as I'm concerned. Um, that, but, but there's there's a plethora of reasons I, I, I prefer the open gate system to the evolved system, not just cost. I think it's a much more passive system. I think you know having the, 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 the individual students show up on a screen with the you know when they mm -hmm. have little bots on them. I think that's kind of that's triggering and targeting. I, I think this is a much better system in a number of reasons. It's much more passive. I also I think in the favor of, of, of going with this expenditure in our next meeting. I'm in favor of open gate. There's a lot of stores. Sometimes you don't even realize you're walking through metal detectors, but there are several stores now. Retail stores, grocery stores, you, when you walk in there, you look around you and you'll be walking through a metal detector. They're everywhere. They are for safety, public safety. I think open gate with the less uh, staff we have to train would be great. And the cost is fabulous. So. Also, the portability, I could move one of those with no problem. The weight is very minimal, very easy to move. So I am all for the open gate. I think it's a necessity. And I, I promised our, I don't know, uh, I didn't have a chance to meet with our ambassadors since we just came back from break about this, but I did kind of prep them to say, be prepared to share your opinion. So I don't know what their opinion it might be, but I want to give them an opportunity to say something if they would like to. Well, I'd just like to say that if it's if it's not this, then what? Because you know, going into school, I'm ready for my education. I shouldn't have to go to school worrying about oh, I I just heard about I just heard about he that person over there. He might have a gun, so I'm gonna worry about that, and I'm worried about my education. No, I shouldn't have to worry about that. I should be able to go to school and get my education so I can worry about my future. But as of right now, I'm going to school and I'm talking to all the other students and what their opinion is. And and the the favorite the favorite quote is I thought they were uh, were already going to add that when I asked their opinions on adding this they say that every time and that it goes to show we're, we're ready to be safe at our school and it's just not happening it's just not there it's not there um i agree i think it would make a lot of students feel a lot safer in the building and um i think that would really help with their academics and their social life I'll check the box. Uh, any other comments or, or statements, questions, anything? Yeah, I mean, I haven't said anything yet because uh, I can't add anything more than what I just heard. Um, you know, actually, Robbie's v first comment was very compelling to me. We we spent over $100,000 on floors in our last meeting. If we didn't go any farther than that, to think $65,000, if we discourage one thing, it's worth every bit of that expenditure. Um, in my opinion, I can't be the pro of the evolved system personally, but we don't have to even talk about that one. Um, and and as you know, I'm a data guy. I love the the idea of as much data as we can. Corey said it last week. She said it again tonight. For me, this is one of those things. It's the absence of data that tells us an awful lot. It's super hard, if not impossible, for us to collect adequate data about the efficacy of something like that unless we, I mean, certainly we could look at community levels over time, but given what's happened in the last couple of years, no historical data will ever tell us what's, what's happening. So for me, we have to move now. Um, and so I echo the support wholeheartedly. 
Um, I equally echo many of the sentiments. Um, I think this is where the student's voice is the most important. Um, and I'd like to proceed uh, with the vote and um, I'm in favor of the open gate. No, I'd like to just take this a step further and say, you know, there's this lack of data we've talked about, but I would promote we actually make the data with us. And so, you know, that survey was kind of short, but it would have been nicer if it was a little longer. So then that way we could repeat it again, you know, assuming we go ahead with open gate, repeat it again in three months or six months, or maybe make a more extensive survey at the middle school level. And then because, you know, $65,000, you could just get the middle school its own set, you know, in the following budget potentially for next year. And then you could then do the middle school before and after and see what perceptions are and that kind of thing. And then you can also say what all was confiscated over a year. And then you could actually present this at like, you know, school uh, conferences or whatever. So I think you, should, you could actually make the data with our school going forwards and be very useful for other schools. So that way then when they're having the discussion in Bloomington, they'll be like, well, they had this data from Urbana, you know? So I think that's the thing we should do. All right, I think, thank you very much. Anybody else, any, any further comments, discussion? All right, um, well, I think we'd expect this would show up on our next uh, meeting agenda. Our next administrative report is uh, by the district goals report. Okay, and Mrs. Norton um, is going to, thank you, Mr. Nance. And I know I usually check in with our student ambassadors about this time, so it is 9.30, and so I'll, I'll leave it up to you if you want to remain for the next presentation, but it's up to you guys what you want to do. So um, as I introduce uh, Assistant Superintendent Norton, um, she's going to kind of give us a mid-year update and check on progress on district and school improvement goals. we're going to be focusing on our district goals and um, to piggyback off of our previous presentation we'll start with our first um, district goal and that's transforming learning spaces to be safe and supportive for all students now there's several layers mentioned here and that by no means encompasses everything that's going on in our schools to support our students and help them develop a sense of belonging. And as they, um, our staff and students interact and from student to student. So some things that are in place are morning meetings and this serves as an opportunity to help students get to know each other, developing and working on social awareness of others, building community within the classroom and it teaches thinking, listening, and speaking skills. Doing a, during a morning meeting, students will practice self-awareness as they reflect on their own feelings and doing good listening and being respectful as others are talking. Another um, method that we've talked about previously is zones of regulation and I'll tie this to some of the community metadata in just a little bit. Historically we thought it probably thought about that as being um, a tool used more so at elementary because it develops common language but what we're seeing from our SHU survey results um, regarding students being able to identify their feelings and emotions we see that as an area of concern at the secondary level as well. And zones of regulation helps our students identify their emotions, reading their own body cues, and knowing what are some tools to help me self-regulate the way I'm feeling. It develops insight on triggers um, and how that um, 
the way that they are acting perceive the way um, and impact the way others are perceiving them. Second step is utilize at the elementary and that um, those lessons focus on empathy and respect, listening with attention, understanding complex feelings and showing compassion and again managing emotions and just as a reminder we're focusing on the castle competencies you know the, the five competencies and, and we focus on that through professional development and with our SEL walkthroughs that our principals are doing and that looks at self-awareness self-management social awareness relationship skills and responsible decision making now utilizing the panorama survey results that will help us bring gain further insight how we can focus these strategies further and when we look at these results you'll see them um, presented a couple different ways and so those were the um, survey pdfs that i sent to you that there was a k2 teacher perception because the students didn't take that by themselves and then the three to twelve student survey and then the family survey we will have the, the teacher survey we've had some logistical glitches to get our, our systems to align so we could get that email out to our teachers and our first attempt was um, or to our staff was december 17th and we want to get our response rate higher we're only at about 20 percent on that right now but when we look at those results and i'll show you some examples and you'll see them on those survey um, results that you that you read through but results will be reported by percent favorable or it could be purport um, as a result by the mean the average of the response answer but these results will where they will really benefit us is once we do the second gen camp too because we can finally have some baseline data which we're really excited about but we want to see from one point to another do we have growth um, you know are, are we seeing that we're moving in a, in a negative trend so that'll help us further and then these results can be broken down demographically so once we get in the panorama system and navigate through that there's a lot of different um, layers to it where we can look at things by race by gender um, by free and reduced lunch the students with IEPs, a lot of different ways there as well. So that I know this is a, a small um, screenshot here, but I just wanted to point out. So when we look at that percent favorable, and you'll see that in your report, that shows you the percentage of respondents who selected a favorable or positive answer score. Now on the topic, most of the answer responses have five choices. And so typically the top two are the most positive or the most favorable. But based on the topic and panorama, there are some questions that may have more than five responses or those responses, there's, there's different types of responses based on the topic. And then there's also the mean, which is the average of the values of the respondent scores as well. So you can look at that two different ways. And then both of these scores are compared nationally through the, the NAC national um, assessment. So looking at our panorama family survey, we had 13.8% that responded we definitely want a higher percentage this next time. We'll be starting um, the week after next with that survey deployment. And when we look at these results, again, there's a lot of different questions. What I try to do is take out some strengths um, or some areas of growth that, that, we, that can be seen um, throughout each survey. So 81 of our families surveyed out of that 13.8% um, do not feel there's any barriers that keep them from being engaged at school. An area of growth for us is that 26% of our families surveyed 
are engaged and interact with each other's groups. So first we, we want a greater response in, in the meeting families where they are to have more engagement. Uh, on our K-2 teacher perception, we had 67.2 participation and 74.8 on our three through 12. There was a 63% um, favorable for social awareness for grades three through five and 57% for grades six through 12. 54% of grades three through five students and 33% of six through 12 students surveyed are able to identify their feelings and emotions. So you can see that difference from K to two versus six through 12 with our secondary students struggling more with being able to reflect on how they're feeling and identifying their emotions. 63% of K through two students had strengths with emotional regulation. And again, this was identified by their teacher. Self-management is an area that needs growth that we see across the district with grades three through five, 45% and six through 12, 49%, how well students manage their thoughts and behaviors in different situations. And again, we're gonna keep the um, staff survey open a little bit longer so that we can get, um, get full pr circle results. I did wanna point out the cycle of inquiry um, as we're looking at our data. And so we are, when we look at it clockwise, we're right there um, on, on the third one because we have for using camera, panorama, we have um, deployed that, we are reflecting on the data. Now we're looking at this next piece with prioritizing, synthesizing, um, determining what our focus is going to be and then we need to also revisit our school improvement and our district improvement plans. I can see a lot of links to all the school improvement. And then that was based off of our, we use our district, district improvement plan as a model for our administrators. As we embark on program council, which is this Thursday, um, our teams will have additional time now that those narratives are completed to revise their goals. So for example, when before we had um, baseline data, we were kind of shooting in the dark to see exactly where you know we were gonna focus those, those points. And we stated that 90% of our students did make 10% growth in Panorama from fall until spring. But when we look at that, we know that we need to hone in more specifically on key, air, key areas like the, the social awareness. So then we'll, con we'll continue with that implement um, SEL instruction and embedding that throughout the school day and then continuing to evaluate and adjust as we get more and more information. And again, it's not all about just panorama. We have different um, strategies that we put in place within the classroom. And then we also have SEL observations. Honestly, it was really difficult for our administrators first 90 when we were focusing on, on students returning to school, helping students um, with their emotion, emotional regulation. And then the second nine weeks, they were coaching the classrooms and getting more and more of the SEL walkthrough. So some of the focus, and we're not even focusing on the whole SEL walkthrough, we're really trying to hone in on a couple of areas. And specifically, it's classroom routines and procedures, explicit SEL instruction, classroom and academic mindsets, and aligning SEL and academic objectives. And so we have to balance all of these things. So when we look at our district goals, SEL is, is really, really important, but we also wanna have that balance with the academic piece too. Um, next week, we will be doing our second benchmark with math for literacy and math. Again, it'll be really helpful when we have those key data points. We have baseline data, but we need to be able to see where we're making growth and in areas that we're not. In addition, we have established the math committee last April, and that's been 
meeting twice each month. We've begun revision of math curricula and recommending resources to pilot across the district, but this time the strong area of focus will be math at Edina High School, but the rest of the district is also establishing priority standards as well as curriculum revision and alignment. As we are promoting enrollment renewal, we have worked closely with our teacher leaders and our instructional coaches as such, we've also had to modify sequences just based on the time that was lost last school year. So that's been done as well. So we're using math as well for literacy. Um, I talked previously about letters. We have about 40 educators that are participating as a self-paced professional development, but then it also requires that they um, are in interactive sessions each month. And then we also have 23 staff members that have completed the Shifting the Balance professional development that aligns with letters. And, and just a reminder, letters is not a, a package canned curriculum. It supports the science of reading and um, within first grade, early um, learning. As we look at our equity goals, there are specific questions. We're, we're going to be really excited to get these results back for our staff. There's components that highlight cultural awareness and action. So we'll be able to get some feedback from that really soon. And then another area of focus is the work that we're doing with our standards-based district committee that's meeting twice a month. And we have PD that's been established with the world-renowned Rick Ramsey that's been meeting with us virtually. Looking at our, our, our fifth goal, the second component of equity, is looking at culturally responsive teaching practices. So I wanted to highlight the, the standards that have been adopted by SAFE, and that's teachers and students working together, developing language and literacy skills across all curriculum, connecting lessons to students' lives, engaging students with challenging lessons, and emphasizing dialogue over lecture. Um, we also are using a substantial amount of our title funds across the district for every level to purchase um, culturally relevant materials for our libraries. And so our, our librarians are making their list and we'll have that to me by the end of the month so we can make sure that students are able to identify with individuals that represent them. So looking at, at next steps, if, and again, you saw the examples with our schools that are sharing their narratives and they're sharing newsletters with the community. Um, we will be updating those goals. Um, NWA math and PMR, PMR memo will start next week. We have allowed more time and are increasing the window just in case we have positive cases. We don't want to cut that short. And we'll continue to focus on our improvement within each school um, surrounding SES equity literacy needs. Any questions? I know you're not surprised. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, and I should apologize. I, I emailed Kim way too many times this week um, about, it's it, mostly about the panorama related stuff. Um, and I was kind of triggered to be thinking about this a while ago. I had lots of parents, myself included, who struggled a bit with just the nature of the questions being asked. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I appreciate that you sent us the responses. Um, but if we look actually at some of the items, they're very confusing in a way, right? So you, you ask, not you, but Panorama asks a question like, how big a problem is it to be involved in school? And then it's 
the school is not welcoming to parents, and then the answers are not a problem at all. So it's a double negative question that's already sort of front loaded. And so I pull that as an example of us not really being able to know if it's an artifact of the question, whether the school is actually welcoming or not is not really what we've even asked, right? We could just say, is the school welcoming, yes or no, or how much do you agree? Um, so the bigger question, I realize this is for you all to implement and not for us, but as we're thinking about continuing to roll this out and use kind of a proprietary canned survey program, I don't know, A, how much we can tinker with the wording of the questions. I don't know how much we can play with what it means to be favorable. And so that's another thing I emailed you about. When I look at something like a small problem, the safety of our school, that's not favorable in my opinion. Like the only favorable answer there is it is not a problem, right? And it, as, as soon as you take out the small, medium, large problems, all of a sudden the favorability ranking drops to something like 60%, at which point we would identify it as a problem mm -hmm. area. So I guess my, my point in saying all these things is data are great as long as we are looking with a real fine tooth comb and then thinking through what do these numbers mean and can we just accept what Panorama tells us is favorable or unfavorable? Can we play with those things? Can we adjust? And then can we make meaning out of the data when we see from student to student, and, and my point on that one is when I looked at all of the school goals, there were some very specific goals, things like 10% uh, change among 90% of students. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, what does 10% change mean? Is that 10% in, like, w what is that in terms of actual learning? It's really hard to make sense of that. Is that a statistically meaningful change? Is it a practically uh, meaningful change? So all those are the questions I sort of just pose as we're moving this forward to round two, getting some more, you know, getting, digging in a little bit more to how can we ask these better? How can we make sure the data we're getting are really reflective of what it is that we want to know to make the, you know, to make adequate changes? Those are really good questions. And so Panorama has a bank on the top of it and it focuses on adaptive competencies and you can look at F5, you can look at F3, but you have to narrow things down and you also want to keep the, the survey parameter in, in a you know, reasonable number of questions for students too so that we get you know, as authentic of a response as we can. Um, one of the wonderful things about it is you can customize these questions. So if we see some things, so even when we go back and we look at five essentials as an administrator, yes, it's relevant data as a whole. These are the five essentials that are effective for schools, but the questions could be, you know, hard. To, we don't know that everyone really understands the way the questions are being asked. We can customize these. So we can customize the responses and, and have that um, consistent from one topic to another, we could adjust that a little bit. In fact, with the family component, this was kind of, we wanted to go through the motions with that to see if it was worth it this year or if it was something that we would customize just completely on our own because of course with everything there is a cost to it and we want to be fiscally responsible making sure that we're getting the bang for our buck and we're able to use this data in ways that are going to impact how our students are feeling at school. But yeah, we can definitely um, customize that. Also addressing, I agree with the goals and I know that we need to go back. You know, we were just with this not having any baseline data, um, not a lot of other districts around us. Again, this is Urbana, but we wanted to go ahead and look at this to say, okay, where do we think we wanna be? But we'll talk about that in program council on Thursday and so for example when we look at 33 percent for example if they can't identify their feelings and emotions and if that's what we we see then from fall to, to spring maybe a more realistic would be that's an area we, where we could say 33 percent is not okay for our students you know and, and then determine what are the goals there and then 
based on our results, what are some interventions that we can put in place at Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 for our students? There are so many layers to this panorama, though, that not all of it comes through even on the PDF. And so I, I can send you as much or as little as you want on this. Because as I mentioned, you can break it down by demographic. We can see things by student if, if there's certain areas where um, where they're not feeling that they have a safe and trusted source, students that we can check in with that maybe um, aren't on our radar with discipline because sometimes with how students are feeling internally, they don't get off to a safe learning environment at school. So there's a lot of pieces to that, but um, for this year, I think we're best on track staying with these original questions and see what the data tells us from one benchmark to the next but then we can definitely be mindful of that, keep providing updates, and then we can most certainly customize to make it better. <coughs> Any other questions? I guess I have one. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned with the, the family participation rate. Has there been any discussion on what we could do to help raise that up? Have we, we gone back to Panorama and asked for suggestions that, you know, that kind of thing? We're going to really market that with our families. I think what happened initially, parents get an email, and sometimes that maybe went to their junk email, and they tried to, you know, keep sending that out multiple times. So, and then I'm also working um, with one of our technology specialists so that we can see if, if it could be a link as well because I think that that's what happens is this first round is it just didn't get to the top of their email. Mm -hmm. well, and, and then we lost, you know, some Are, are we reaching out over text as well? I mean, uh, my, my biggest concern, well, big, uh, lots of concerns, but with this like a 13% participation rate from families, right, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be overly represented by families of privilege, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. And so we're not going to get anywhere near representative data um, from that group. Um, so we've really got to work harder on, on trying to, to change that. And once um, the, the tech folks can create it as a link, then we can send it out like we've been doing with some of our other updates through Skylert with the texting. Um, we've seen, Catherine and I have seen some really nice responses and engagements around text. So Paul's right, like just putting a link in there once we can figure out how to do that. And so, and so what we're also going to be having, I think it's right around January 20th, the five essentials so for the state of Illinois that will be deployed as well and so just for a point of reference in order for five essentials to be reported on individual school report cards schools need to get 20 percent parent participation family participation on that and for those of you that can remember with your principals in the past there are lots and lots of reminders practically knocking on doors to get to that 20%. It is not easy. And so we'll just have to, uh, again, I think our families need to know why this is important. And we just have to really reiterate that. And this is, we, we really need to hear from them because we're hearing from their students, we're hearing from their teachers. And um, again, we select these questions. And so it's about us here. So we, we definitely will we'll continue to work on that. Anyone else? Yeah, um, I kind of wanted to echo some of Brian's concerns. Um, I do think the more we can engage in our, our question asking, I, th I, I would also think that might garner more participation. Um, I believe this sort of came up in that first round. I did feel like, I think some of the questions in and of themselves are a little difficult to like suss out what it is the school's trying to like, get at and use what are they using it for um and then i i can't remember i'm assuming these also all they also go out in spanish and french and is that yes they do okay thanks all right no question a anyone else all right uh, well thank you very much thank you uh, there are no action items tonight, so I think uh, there's no call uh, for future special executive meetings at this time. Superintendent's report. All right. Um, normally, um, I am going to do do have a kind of.
of a different report. It is going to feel more like an administrative report instead of a superintendent report um, because I am going to be sharing um, some of our uh, COVID um, mitigations and some COVID updates. We shared the agenda so early. I wasn't comfortable putting this on as a uh, formal agenda item, you know, giving you an update. Um, I wanted to really be able to put some real time numbers in here today. So um, as always, Catherine does the board update. So we'll make sure that this full presentation is in the board update when she shares it out tomorrow or the next day. Um, and we'll send it to board members too, because it does have, have some good information in it. Um, and then Lori will share it out with our um, email group, um, our UEA members and, and those folks as well. Um, so they have it. So um, this is a little more of an, an administrative report than a typical superintendent report. So bear with me and I apologize for that. But again, it is kind of um, on the spot info. So uh, testing numbers, um, I, I did want to just highlight, I know there's been a lot of comments on social media. I've gotten tons of emails sent to me directly. I know you guys have been receiving emails as well um, about the concerns with coming back with Omicron. So we'll talk about that here in a minute. But um, as a district, um, I do want to say we are committed to testing. Um, if you look at all of our, this is a great comparison point for us, Anne, because when we look at Rantoul and Bloomington and Normal and all these districts around us, no one is doing as much COVID testing as we are. I can just say that emphatically, and it, it is the truth. Um, we are testing through drive-throughs in buildings, um, it, and, and we strongly believe um, that testing is what is going to help us um, be able to stay in school a little bit longer. Now, there, will, there may be points, and we'll discuss this in a moment, where we have to pivot to remote. Um, but it was important for us to come back um, and get students back into a routine. Um, my fear was if we didn't come back um, from winter break, we would be weeks and weeks and weeks uh, down this path. And it was, it was important for us to get back, get some testing going. Um, a lot of families uh, took advantage of testing in the community. And I know that because on Monday morning, we had a lot of our schools getting those phone calls. We tested at Searcy and we tested at Marketplace. And um, so we do have a large number of our students that are in quarantine and isolation right now. And that has nothing to do with school transmission. That is Christmas and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and New Year's Eve and all the things that people did during the two weeks that they were out. Um, so our goal uh, this week is just to test as many people as we possibly can isolate those positive cases um, before they're able to get in the building and take their masks down at lunch and do all these other things that we're talking about. Um, and I think we've done a good job of that these first two days. So just in the first two days uh, with the student drive through that we had right here in the parking lot um, and our staff drive through, this does not include Yankee Ridge after school drive through, right, John? Um, but we had a large number of people come through Yankee Ridge drive through today after school. So yep. this is this is just the additional testing they did in the last. It also doesn't include the regular Yankee oh, Ridge this doesn't testing include during our, the yeah. day. Uh, this is just the additional staff and student drive throughs we put in place for Monday and Tuesday. Um, so we tested almost 600 people in the two days. Um, we isolated many, many positives um, and prevented lots of people from walking in our doors on Monday morning and on Tuesday morning. So it, it, I think it was very effective and um, hopefully will help us um, be able to stay in person as long as we possibly can. Um, our goal is to, uh, we've even been talking about maybe making this a weekly student drive through. Um, we were able to hire um, some additional CNAs over the break and that has helped tremendously. Uh, we still have a large number of people doing testing. I'm going to Yankee Ridge in the morning to test a, a, a class where we're doing some tests to stay. So we are all on ha um, all hands on deck with this. Uh, Tim was here this morning, the last two mornings. I mean, we were here at 6.30 in the morning getting ready for testing. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased with the response from our families. Um, and just want to say people are taking this very seriously. And, they're going to test in the community, they're testing here, um, and this is what is really gonna help us uh, be able to, you know, we'll have to pivot and we'll have to do some different things um, 
as we get further into the winter months, but our testing protocols are what are really gonna help us. So I just wanted to kind of start us off with that. Jennifer, is it okay if I ask this little question? Yeah, I don't even know if definitely. we have an answer to it. Are we, you wanna we go back caught to a lot of people, which is great. I mean, but do you think that the increase in numbers caught was just simply because we had more people testing or you think because it's Omicron that we're dealing with? I think it was a lot of people that were um, having symptoms. So I walked up to many cars in the last two days of people who drove up and said, um, hey, we are experiencing some symptoms. We don't know if we have COVID. And sure enough, we tested them. And some people didn't, some people didn't. Um, and I think people knowing that we had that drive through option maybe didn't feel comfortable going in the community. I don't know, and waited to come and go through our testing. But um, I think it is, it, I, I don't know if it's Omicron. We have no way to know that from our rapid tests that we do. Um, but I do think the positivity rate that we're seeing is much higher than what we would normally um, be seeing through our surveillance testing. And we'll, today was our first uh, school surveillance day in elementary, uh, middle school and high school had field yesterday. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of an increase in just our weekly surveillance numbers in terms of positivity. So yes, mm. I, I, I think we're seeing it in our weekly regular surveillance too. Sorry to interrupt. I'm just yeah, I'm, no. I'm really glad that we're getting to the high numbers of people who want to be tested. I want you guys to, to ask tested. questions. Yeah, That's no, why I said no, this no. is not a Thank typical you. superintendent report. So you can we can kind of have a discussion on these. So, so that was a good question, John. I don't know if you want to add anything more to what Ann. Yeah, and so for the first again, it wasn't included with including our regular testing. We would have been well over 900 tests in two days, which is a a uh, very high amount. Usually we're at 1,200 for an entire week, uh, 1,100, 1,200, as you'll see a little later. But our very first day that we did the base surveillance testing at Yankee Ridge today, uh, the numbers were about two and a half times what they would normally be. Again, we don't have any way to say is that Omicron or is that because everybody was mingling with family over the holidays. But the numbers for those schools were a little bit higher, but not uh, not substantially higher, so. Mm -hmm. So um, as you know, we've been testing weekly, um, well twice a week at middle school and high school um, for students and staff, and once a week at Yankee Ridge, Leo and Dr. Williams. Um, around Thanksgiving break, we added King in as a weekly surveillance site. Um, and because we were able to hire additional staff um, to help us with testing over winter break, we are now going to be able to offer weekly surveillance at Thomas Paine and Wiley. So they are really excited about that. They've been waiting for their turn. Um, so Tuesday will be <laughs> Thomas Paine's uh, weekly surveillance testing day. Wiley's will be Wednesday. Um, unfortunately, just due to the timing of hiring um, all the people that we've hired, um, we weren't able to start that this week. We also have to collect consent forms from families. So both schools are collecting consents this week and we will start um, next week. We'll have a, a testing team number two going out to Thomas Paine and Wiley. Jennifer, I have a, yes. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. sorry, Dr. Ivory Tatum, I have a quick question for you. Um, do we still have plenty of tests? Because I know that's a problem in the community and even at some of the yep. sites, there's, they're running low on tests. So. So um, yeah, we do this week, <laughs> every week, or uh, every time I put an order in, we're always kind of uh, crossing our fingers and hoping that we get the delivery that we've asked for. And up until this point, we have. We just received uh, a delivery yesterday. So um, again, Brenda, I don't know. I think mm -hmm. um, my connections and the people that I work with directly at IDPH have said to us, um, because of the level of testing that we're doing in our district, we are helping our community significantly. So um, they're gonna do everything that they can to continue to get us tests. But again, right. um, when shortages happen, we that we've not experienced that yet, but that doesn't mean that that would not happen. All right, so. thank you. Well, that's yep. good news that we. Yep. Okay. So weekly COVID testing. So. Um, we have been steadily increasing the amount of testing. Um, John, I'm gonna let you kind of talk about this chart. So this chart by, uh, reflects our Binax, which is our rapid testing, and the red bar is our shield testing. So as you know, we started testing at the very beginning of the year, um, and I'll let John kind of yep. take over and, and explain this one. So this, 
just really reflects kind of the volume and the kind of increased volume that we've been taking on over the year for testing, uh, both uh, the surveillance testing program, the symptomatic testing that we're doing in the schools, uh, all of the drive-through testing for staff and students has been slowly ramping up. It's a little noisy there. There was, I think, was it a homecoming that we did some bulk testing for earlier in the year uh, and then a little noisier around the holidays. But the uh, trend is increasing and continues to increase each week, uh, which is great. Uh, and then every week we're kind of increasing and adding schools, adding students to field, uh, and that gives us a little bit more opportunity uh, to get some uh, positive cases out of the school system as quickly as we can before one case becomes three cases, becomes nine cases, becomes a classroom. Mm -hmm. So getting one case out is really has a compounding effects uh, going into the future. And if you look at those, can you go back to that, yeah. John? If you look at that slide, I know one thing, um, you know, I've, I've received a few comments from um, parents who've emailed uh, uh, specifically asking about shields. Um, we've been utilizing shields from the very beginning, but unfortunately, if you look at our numbers, not all of our students are taking advantage of this opportunity um, that they have to have shield testing twice a week. We've done everything we can to increase those numbers. Um, John offers raffles. He's doing some, you know, we purchase uh, raffle prizes out of our, you know, not using district funds, and we kind of donate gift cards that we can give away to um, students who participate in shield testing and um, all of our other testing um, opportunities. But we would really like to see that number be larger. Um, so any families that are watching, um, shield is, uh, you know, it is something that, um, is a gift to us, and, I, and I'm grateful that we have it. Um, we manage it with our own staff. We even make the delivery to the lab. Our own people drop off the, res drop off the samples. Um, but we would really like to see that in the hundreds, and you know, we'd like to see you know, 500 students um, taking advantage of that, and we just don't have that. Um, we try to incentivize it, so if you guys have other ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, sometimes I think people don't test because they don't want to know the results. So I think that could be a little of the, this. Um, I don't know, but um, we are really under utilizing our shield. Um, and so right now we're trying to do some, some fun things to get the students to go through the shield testing at the middle school and high school. Um, so I just wanted to point that out too because I know we've had a lot of families uh, asking about SHIELD, um, and it is here, and we've had it since the very beginning of the year. We just don't have the large numbers that we would like to have there. So, John, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. But yeah, and if you know high school, middle school students, tell them we've tried to make it as convenient as possible and give them as many opportunities as possible. This week they can win some McDonald's, <laughs> so have them go, uh, go buy the SHIELD testing. Um, so weekly COVID testing, as uh, John uh, put together this little graphic for us uh, that kind of shows our um, testing calendar. Um, we also, as we've talked about here at the district level, we have multiple crews. As I mentioned, now we have a team one, team two testing team. Um, we have our nurses who are continually testing. Um, they conduct in-school testing for symptomatic students. They conduct um, in-school testing for close contact. Um, we also are part of the Illinois Department of Public Health, um, the Test to Stay program. Um, we also uh, implement outbreak testing. So when we have a one classroom that has three or more positives, um, then we will go to a classroom and test that classroom twice a week. So that is more of an elementary uh, model, um, you know, it, we can't do that at the middle school and high school, so at the middle school and high school, it is much more uh, testing of close contacts. Um, we've done tests to stay for our sports uh, programs, um, our student athletes, uh, so there is just a lot of weekly testing happening. Um, I don't see that slowing down at all, um, more so we're, we're talking now about more testing that we could provide uh, specifically to students um, with Omicron. So. So I'm um, going into, John, did you refresh? Yeah. So I added, go, yeah, if you go back. 
So um, just today there was, uh, we have been kind of, a, another reason why this uh, information wasn't shared last week is um, we have been waiting for additional guidance from the Illinois State Board of Education and IDPH about remote learning and they just have not given us anything. Um, unfortunately, that's been a little discouraging um, that they, knowing that um, the schools south of I-80 are all back in school this week, um, we were really hoping that we would have um, some really um, firm guidance from ISDE and, and we received some things today. So um, it's not on the slide, but um, in my notes, I added um, Dr. Ayola, our state superintendent, sent out um, some guidance about adaptive pause um, today in the ISDE weekly message. I think, do you guys all get the ISDE weekly message? Some of you do, I think. So in that message today, if you wanna go reference it, um, she talks about adaptive pause and really encouraging districts to utilize that kind of as a last resort. You know, if you're doing all of the other things like masking, testing, um, vaccines, uh, excluding close contacts, um, ISD is saying that adaptive pause should not be necessary. However, um, we are, are not going to, I think with the number amount of testing that we're doing, with the high vaccination rates that we have of staff, um, we've offered multiple opportunities for people in our community to vac vac uh, get the vaccine um, student and staff. We are doing all of those things. So as we continue to see those, uh, our cases um, get higher, we are going to implement adaptive pauses as we need to. Um, and she also talks a lot in the message today about working directly with the local health departments. Um, I know a lot of people in the community were wanting me to uh, kind of make that decision on my own um, about remote learning. But again, those are decisions that, and our state superintendent said it today, um, those are decisions that we do need to make with our local public health officials um, and specifically with CECHC in our case. So. Um, we'll continue to keep the lines of communication open between um, CECHC when we make when we need to make collaborative decisions about things like adaptive pause. Um, we'll do that. We have been aggressively updating the COVID dashboard. We know that a lot of our families actively check the dashboard um, and want to see um, our positivity numbers. So we've been trying to update it, um, if not daily, a couple times a day. Um, we're doing our very best to cover staff shortages. However, um, there may be a point where we won't be able to do that. I know um, you all know that we utilize two of our, uh, our uh, e-learning days prior to Thanksgiving, and that was primarily uh, not COVID related, that was more staff shortage related. We just did not have enough staff, and we knew we would not have enough staff um, to be able to safely have in-person learning on that Monday and Tuesday before Thanksgiving. So we've utilized two of those days. We have three remaining. Um, those are days that we could, of course, use for um, all full district remote if we chose to. However, we also um, utilize those days for inclement weather. Um, my goal and my hope is that before we would move the whole district to um, e-learning, that we would do more adaptive pauses, building by building, class by class, um, where we have outbreaks, where we have staff shortages. Um, honestly, the, diff the building that has been the most difficult to staff, I would say since early November, has been our middle school. Um, we have been struggling with the number of uh, staff out, um, not just because of COVID, just for all kinds of reasons. Um, and that is continuing. So there may be a point where we have to have an adaptive pause at the middle school level. Um, but that doesn't mean we have to shut the whole district down because we can't um, appropriately staff or ban a middle school. So those are conversations that we'll have as a district. Um, those are conversations we will have with uh, Julie Pride in the public health department when we have to make those decisions. Um, we'll do our very best for parents um, to let you know at least a full day in advance if we have to close a building. Um, we've only closed, I can think of one classroom uh, that we took fully remote for two days 
um, due to, and this was not recently, this was months ago, um, and we notified their families, we sent the kids home, they stayed home for two or three days, and we were able to kind of mitigate the spread in that particular room. So that is uh, what I would like to do as long as we can. So as long as we can pause in a classroom, at a school, um, in specific uh, areas, to me is um, the best course of action because we have kids that need to be in school. I'm just, we know that. We've seen the behaviors, we know the academic concerns. Um, we did have quite a few families who uh, kept their kids home and I have respected that decision and I'm, I'm thankful for the families that have the ability and the privilege to be able to do that. A lot of our families went to work yesterday because they had to <laughs> and their kids had to be in school. Um, and so we're gonna do the best that we can to keep school open as long as we possibly can, um, utilizing adaptive pause uh, in the best way that we, we um, need to. So we believe the best place for learning is in our classrooms with our fantastic teachers. Uh, but we want families to know that if and when we're given direction by CUTHD or um, ISDE to go fully remote or our governor, um, I know he's not mentioned that at all recently, we will pivot as we need to to do so. Um, next is planning for remote learning. So we have been, we have contingency plans in place. I don't want people to think um, we're not moving in that direction because we're not prepared for it. Um, we recognize in-person learning is the most effective means of teaching our students. And we know that there may be um, times in the next couple weeks or the months to come that we have to utilize remote learning for lots of different reasons. Um, so, um, John, I'll let you talk to these bullets because they're mostly technology related. Sure, and uh, I just wanted to make this very clear. This isn't a plan for what we were doing like March 2020 or uh, earlier where we were just sending everybody home and we're just kind of doing drive through tapping. So we have at the start of the year, uh, all of the students as we uh, completed our one-to-one -one Chromebook rollout across the district, uh, not just making sure that all the Chromebooks are in the classroom, but that all the students are assigned a Chromebook. So all of the schools at the beginning of the year and is being refreshed uh, for the start of the spring semester uh, have a Chromebook on them with their name shiny on the front of the Chromebook. Uh, so in the event that we do need to, uh, if we have a weather report, oh, there's gonna be 12 inches of snow tomorrow, uh, the teachers in those classrooms can grab those Chromebooks, give them to the students uh, to take home for that day or week or whatever they need, uh, and then they'll be able to bring them back uh, into the schools the following day. Uh, we will have uh, available for all the schools extra chargers, so we're not asking teachers, again, like we were uh, a year and a half ago to go and unwire uh, 4,000 Chromebooks from classrooms. Uh, those will be kept at the school where in the event that we need them, they'll be able to go down to the front office and grab the chargers that the students need for those Chromebooks. Uh, we have Zoom in place uh, district-wide for all the teachers, uh, Zoom professional, and uh, we've, good or bad, uh, built up a lot of expertise on Zoom, as I'm sure all of you have as well. Uh, so we have those things in place for teachers uh, we have processes in place with uh, standardizing on some LMS systems that, uh, again, across the district, uh, there's processes in place for, especially at secondary, teachers to assign uh, and collect schoolwork from students, uh, whether they're remote or in person. And as we've transitioned uh, over the last year and a half to a lot more digital resources, uh, a lot of teachers have kind of adapted their learning plans and taken this as a opportunity to modernize a lot of what they're doing. So I feel a lot better the, about where we are as a district right now moving forward uh, and that we'll be able to better adapt and uh, pivot uh, to uh, whatever circumstances that we have to face. So um, the last couple slides are more of my typical celebratory <laughs> messages in the superintendent report, but before I move to those, 
Are there any, does anybody have any questions about, yep, Paul? Has there been any discussion with regards to limiting attendance at, at sporting events or? So we're already doing that. Okay. So we already have had, uh, we announced that, I'm not remembering, Catherine, in early December and when basketball started. So at the high school, um, we allow each athlete um, four tickets um, and we have set a capacity limit in the gym um, at the at high school events and middle school events. And middle school was allowing six um, uh, people to attend per athlete and they have now lowered it to four as well. IHSA has not really, uh, or IESA, have, has not really put out anything about capacity limits, but um, Mr. Waller and I met about it early on um, in December. And just based on the size of our gym at the high school, we, we don't have a huge gym space. Uh, so we just felt it was prudent it without IHSA really telling us to do it, to do it. And so we have. There um, quite a few districts around us have not put in limits and some have so it, it just kind of depends on the school i think but we do have put capa uh, capacity limits at this time good question uh, sorry yeah um i my, i had some questions about lunch um i wanted to bring back what one of our student ambassadors brought yeah. up quite a bit earlier yep but can you speak to kind of lunchroom um management i obviously it's tricky being outside but i know that there was mention that might still be an option at ums so can you talk about some of the mitigation matter measures for lunch so right now so outside is still going to be an option at the middle school and high school we just haven't been able to do it the last two days because the the um we have specific weather uh rules that we follow so we wouldn't have students outside when it's you know 20 mm -hmm. degrees and depending on the wind chill um, so once the temperatures uh, rise again and it's warm enough uh, past, we have a threshold uh, where we don't take students outside for a certain amount of time. Uh, once we're over that again, of course, middle school and high school uh, students will be able to go back outside to eat. We just could not do that today and yesterday. Um, Mr. Nance uh, said he is going to meet with both of the uh, student ambassadors about their comments around lunch. Um, the high school did uh, go to a four seat, four students sitting at a table as um, Michael mentioned, um, and they put additional supervisors in the lunchroom. Um, it is just really, really hard just based on the sheer numbers. Um, the lunch periods that are the toughest are the ones for our freshmen and our sophomore um, students because they can't leave campus. And so uh, we're trying to spread them out however we can and um, using some additional classrooms um, so yes, that is still, we're still, it's just day two of us being back. So I think they are um, really trying different things. Um, Mr. Nance told me as he left, uh, he sent me an email and said he's gonna meet with uh, Parker and Michael to hear a little bit more. They're underclassmen, the freshman is, I think Parker's a sophomore and Michael's a freshman. Um, so they are in those spaces where it probably does feel like more students. Um, so we're doing the best that we can on that. Middle school is spreading kids out everywhere and they've been doing that pretty much all year, utilizing the portable, uh, utilizing a lot of other spaces. Um, at the elementary level, um, principals were working the weekend before break. Like I know one uh, elementary school uh, put tables in the hallway to be able to spread more kids out. And so we have kids even eating in the lunch in the hallway at this point. Um, so principals are trying to do whatever they can to, because that is one of my biggest concerns too, is lunch is the space where the masks are down. Um, so we really wanna make sure that we're spreading students out as much as we can. Yes, good question. I should have put a slide on for that. <laughs> Any other COVID related or questions before we move on okay um, celebration we have a new national board certified teacher uh, as you know uh, we're a district very much committed to the national board uh, program and our most recent um, person to reach that goal is second grade teacher miss Surratt at Thomas Paine so congratulations to Kay Surratt so, we're very proud of you and last but not well, this is, well, not last but not least, but this uh, month, January, is Board Appreciation Month. 
Um, so again, I know we had Board Appreciation Day, but now you guys get a whole month. So <laughs> yay. So Catherine will be posting some more, uh, you know, social media posts and just uh, opportunities for the community, hopefully, to thank you for your service. We thank you for your dedication and service to our students. Um, and hopefully uh, many other people are going to be reaching out and thanking you as well. January is also mentoring month, but we'll talk about that at our next meeting. Um, January 14th is Institute Day. Um, no school for EC5, early dismissal for UMS and UHS. Um, and then of course we are not in school on Monday, um, January 17th for Martin Luther King Day. So as we hear, I'm not quite sure, uh, normally this time of year we would be sharing more about Martin Luther King events that would be happening in the community. I don't, I'm not really sure um, what those events will look like. Um, we will be sharing out the students who receive the Martin Luther King um, scholarships at Cranard. I'm not, I'm, I don't know if that event will happen in person or not. Um, so I will keep you posted on that. So that is it. Sorry for the extra detail, but I know uh, several of those COVID related slides are, are things people really wanted some information about. So. Any board reports? I'm oh, sorry. Ms. No, I was just going to follow up. Um, it says right oh. now on the diversity w um, sub website of for the U of I that the celebration on Sunday, January 16th is happening. At the it's Cranor. still in person. Okay. And I know the last time I was <coughs> at the Cranor, you had to show proof of vaccination. Um, so bring your card or if you've got, you know, if you're affiliated and you've got it on your, in your safe real Illinois or whatever thing, but yeah, that's, that's what it says now. Wonderful. I don't know when okay. this was last updated. So. so we will start sharing that. I don't have the names of the students in this slide, but I do have them. So we'll recognize our Urbana students who yeah. have received the scholarship. So. Okay. No question. All right. Uh, board reports. Okay. All right. Hearing none. I'd like to. Uh, recognize uh, Anna Seaman for running our, our cameras yet again tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anna. Um, uh, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Uh, roll call. Member Orr. Yes. Member Hasanaka. Yes. Member Hall. Yes. Member Ogalski. Yes. Member Carter votes yes. Vice President Exum. Yes. And President Pulaski. Yes, uh, thanks everybody. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you. Sorry, Jennifer, it looked like the veneered thing all.